Maybe. Oh, wait. <laughs> it is coming in King C for ranking things before. I I'm underestimated. You are greedy. Free stuffs. <laughs> Free stuffs. I will gladly take that B4 pump because oh, wow. I'll, then I'll go full Pac Man on you. Yeah. I, that's uh, another uh, Pac Man. I'm Look at the, the Chang Dependence. They are about to clinch that win that they need. They need only one point for the bronze medal. That's Team Spirit holding on to each other. This is one last endgame. Two endgames they have, but the board four match, that looks way more peaceful right. than the board two games. I think we should focus on board two. This is the match. This match will be decided on board two. And we are back here getting ready for the action to start. And I see many of you in the Twitch chat using your favorite team, Emotes. And Anna, we're going to start with the Armenia Eagles. we got to uh, mention how successful they've been throughout the Proches League history. And in particular, as mentioned, Zavin Andreas in 52 games this season. I mean, that's just ridiculous. How you know, He's the, the leader of this team, the clear leader. And what does he need to do today or the rest of his teammates to beat a team like the Chongri Pandas? Yesterday he had a really tough role in, in meeting Fabiano Caron on board one. So today it's somewhat easier, can we say that, when you are facing a 27 <laughs> GM as an opponent. But of course, Zavin Andresian is a World Cup player himself. You see his classical rating is 26.03. But apart from that, he's a top 15 player in the world in terms of blitz chess. So in faster time controls, he's a really strong player. We can see him on screen right now. He's getting ready for his game, wearing the uniform of his team and the Barcelona colors on their uniform. Yeah, he's also very good at listening to me, so he's probably mad that we're talking about him right now. <laughs> but we here we have Haik Martirosian, the young, great player who won the Aeroflot Open recently. So he's shown immense success, and he will be both the present and the future of the Armenian chess team. He's played 42 games this year. He's been very integral part of the team and now he knows we're talking about him there he, he knows is. it he's only 18 <laughs> years old and he's the current armenian champion one of the top players of their country also in terms of rapid chess because here we are for the rapid competition and yes it's a very young team on board three another youngster 16 year old chancer gisian not a brother of anna we have learned it we have been corrected all the time that yep. Anna and Shant are not brothers and sisters. I got a stern response from Artak Manukian when I said they're brother and sisters. Like, no, they're not. And I'm like, okay, my bad, Artak. We're good now. But uh, Shant Sergeyevsian, what he is, is an amazing player. Look at that record. 30 and a half out of 42 in the Pro Chess League, performing well above his rating. And of course, the team is rounded out by Anna Sargsyan on board four. And she had a tough day yesterday, but she did her job in beating the board four for the St. Louis Archbishops. And today, she'll hope to get a better performance and help her team win the match over the very tough Shangri Pandas. And that score is 16 out of 34 for Anna. It's really impressive knowing that board fours face board one, board two, and board three of every other team. And she also has an almost 50% score. She has been the best performing board four. She collected more points than any other board four here in the Pro Chess League finals. Yeah, and speaking of boards one, two, and three, is there a more potent lineup than this team here with the Chogdu Pandas supporting Lee Chow on board one, rated over 2,700. He is the coach of an academy. He's helped so many young players improve their game, and he's played 12 games before this weekend, 2708 rating. He's just an awesome player. And so is board two for them. Wang Yue, he is one of my favorite players, honestly. His endgame prowess, I've been just drooling over it for, honestly, for a decade now. And I'm very impressed with his play. And here he's almost like, I feel like he's looking at us as we talk about is him. Is he? <laughs> but and Zhang Di, their board four, I'm not even skipping board three, but I just wanted to mention board four real quick because he's a 12-year-old boy who is a student of both Wang Yue and Li Chao. How lucky are you when you have these top 
Chinese players, Olympic players, training you as a 12. You are a 12-year-old prodigy, I'm and there de- you go. I'm definitely jealous. I don't know about you, but those are some fantastic players to learn from. And another fantastic player is Zhao Jun here. He's played 30 games in the Pro Chess League, rated over 2,600, had the best checkmate of the year with the two knights in the center of the it board. It was beautiful. Yeah, he had Danny and I freaking out about that one. And he's a force on board three over 2,600. He's higher rated than some of the board ones across the Pro Chess League. Mm-hmm. And, of course, on board four, the one, the only, Zhang Di. Anna, what can we say about this youngster? Uh, he's going to be on the Olympic team of China. That's my prediction. Wow, that's bold. I know. I'm bold. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has been a fantastic player for them. And if you see his rating there, 1966, you have to remember that the team has to average 2,500 across the four boards. That really helps you build a lineup with uh, Wang Yue, Li Chao on the top two boards. But he's so underrated. It's very clear that he's an improving player and improving fast. And so here we see him on screen. He's just he's calm. He's ready to play his game. And that's all chess players, right? They just want to get the action underway. Yes, we are about to start. You can see the jersey of the Chengdu Pandas, this green-black color. I was trying to come up with a football reference, but I'm so bad at football that I don't know what other team would wear these colors in terms of football teams, football clubs. Well, I was in Seattle last weekend, and the Seattle Sounders have similar uniform. So uh, we see here the pairings for the first round of action here. And Anna, when you look at these pairings, who needs to do what for each team? I always feel like board fours, if they can get a half a point against these top players, so they are going to face board one, board two, and board three before they meet each other, the board fours against each other in round four. So if they can get half a point that's going for Anna Sargisyan and Zhang Di, that would be already great for their teams. Apart from that, we will have to see how Wang Yua will be performing in the first round. Shan Sargisyan is one of the top players of the Pro Chess League all the other weeks that we have covered leading up to the semifinals and finals. He has been one of the MVPs of the Pro Chess League. So that's not an easy game for Wang Yue and the other Armenian player. Of course, current champion of Armenia, Haik Martirosian, will do his best to beat Zhao Jun, I'm sure. Yeah, that's actually a very level matchup by rating, right? We see Haik Martirosian board two for Armenia playing the board three. Zhao Jun, who is higher rated than he is, at least when the Pro Chess League season started. But that's a toss-up matchup. And typically, in the early rounds, whenever one of those players can outlast the others, then that will be a huge result for them. Indeed, the games are about to begin. And, and yeah, well, the games are going to begin very shortly here at the Folsom Street Foundry. And, I mean, also the youngster, Zhang Di. I'm always curious when I don't know too much about a player besides how exciting it is that a young player can uh, play so well against so many good uh, opponents. And, oh, just an opportunity of a lifetime to be here and play Grandmaster after Grandmaster in an event like this. Indeed. I think we have our first game that has just begun between Haik Marty Rossian with the Black Pieces facing Zhao Jun. Yes, and the games are underway here. We see that Zha Jun opts for the London system, right? The early bishop f4. And these openings are very solid, right? You develop this bishop and then the pawn, so your bishop doesn't get caught behind it. And I like this approach by Hike. It's more of a fighting approach, I think. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people try to say, oh, I'm going to go after this bishop, like with a move like knight to h5. But it wastes time. And you're not actually trapping it so quickly because the bishop can always go to g5. And... Well, they're playing so quickly that before I can even make my point, you play h3 so you can slide your bishop back. And Anna, what do you think about this? I was this going bishop to ask you the same, and well, now I'm putting you're asking you the question. The I wanted that question. Uh, I'm sorry. Oof, bishop d6. Offering the trade of bishops, and if bishop takes d6, c takes d6, you are accepting a position with doubled pawns, but that pawn on d5, so you have two doubled, two d pawns, yep. and that will help you strengthen your center. So doubled pawns have pros and cons, and in this case, the the c file is a semi-open file for black, and he can have a better control of the center after pushing d6, controlling the e5 square as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I'll, often I struggle with knowing what at what point do I play for c4, which undoubles the pawn but gives me more space, mm-hmm. or do I play c3 instead and land here? And there's the answer, c3. Because the pawn c3, it's a semi-open file, as you mentioned, but it can't become a target because this pawn is protected by another pawn, which means that once your rook gets to c8, it's staring into kind of a brick wall. And I like this approach, generally speaking, from black because at the same time, how do you attack black's position? You can go... Make a move like queen b3 eventually, but you're not going to be able to team up with this pawn on b6, which is also easy to defend. So I think Hike Martirosin is going for a very solid foundation of his position that's hard to take advantage of. 
I agree with you. The question will be, will he try to do more? Is it a game where he is aiming for simply equalizing and being solid? Or will he be more ambitious with the black pieces? I would say that when you have the black pieces, normally it's okay to equalize. It's okay to keep the position. Also, taking into account that this is a team event and no one really wants to push too much. You don't want to take too much risk because just a one loss and the match can be over because of your game. But they say you have to risk it to get the biscuit, and I'm hungry, so I, I think there should be some risk as long as I get the biscuit at the end. I'd and, like to get some biscuit, too. <laughs> and, I mean, this just in general, right, this approach from uh, Zhao Jun, what do you make of it? Because, you know, you're playing for your team, and you have the higher-rated top few boards, and mm -hmm. you play a solid opening like this, which you know, based on your experience, your preparation, that it gives Black a very solid position that... It's not you know it's not not worrying too much, and so if your opponent's in good shape, they can equalize and hold steady. So would you kind of advise people to play something a little bit more risky or double edge, or do you think that solid approach is just fitting of his style? I think if it's the player's style, then I then he should definitely stick to this solid style. If he's like let's say Hikaru Nakamura, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be enjoying this position that much. So depending on the player's style. And also considering what the team situation is, we are just beginning the match. We don't know if he will have to go play for a win. It may happen by the end of this match that in some of the last games, a player will have to take more risk because they need that point to tie the score. But for now, at the beginning of the match, I think this is a good strategy going for a solid position and just seeing how the rest of the boards will go. I definitely agree with you. It's sort of that boa constrictor approach where you're taking your time, you're being methodical about it. And Well, actually, in sometime soon, C4 will be on the docket because if you take on C4, then my knight will take back and start attacking some of your pawns. But that kind of begs the question, once C4 happens, does black even have to take, right? I can just leave my pawn on D5 because after C4, if you ever take here, well, I can take back with one of my minor pieces and say I'm, I'm doing quite well in the center. Yes, I like this move, Queen A3. It's pinning the pawn on D6. So in the future, he could try to play Knight E5 if, if it happens. Rook F E8 immediately defending the Queen. But also, thanks to Queen A3, White will be able to push the B pawn if he wants to. Although that will create a backward C3 pawn. So you must be careful with these pawn pushes. Right, because as soon as you push that pawn, you leave the other one behind. But that's a, a spatial grab, right? B4, maybe A5 or B5. But even if... You go B4, and then push. if you push B5, maybe I'll go A5. Mm -hmm. And if you push A5, I'll go B5. So I'm just trying to close the queen side down and claim, well, you're not getting anything over there, so where's the action going to take place? And if no action takes place, maybe we should just shake hands and agree on a draw. I think this is a potential draw game, but we're going to see more action later. I'm pretty sure that both players will try to create something. And now, another game that has just started is between Anna Sergeyesian and Li Chao. So board one of the Chengdu Pandas with the black pieces facing board four of the Armenia Eagles. And look at this opening, by the way. It's a D4, B6. And that's the wow. opening where you know the higher rated player is trying to get out of theory as quickly as possible and outplay, well, he hopes his overmatched opponent, but Anna Sargisin is very talented. And she just responds very typically, classically, with playing in the center. This is almost as good as D4, F6 by Fabian, I was <laughs> going to mention. <laughs> That was a funny slip, wasn't yeah. it? And, well, this position, right? We got out of the opening here, and we've all been through this where we play a strong player, and we're like, I, I know they want to beat me. And so with the white pieces, how do you balance the desire to be solid with the desire to say, with the uh, also knowing that you have a good position out of the opening and maybe play for something more energetic? Um, good question. I think Anna is doing very well so far. I was impressed with her preparation and middle game play in the previous match as well. The results didn't go that well, yeah. but I think she she doesn't mind having to face all these stars, these 2700, 2600 grandmasters, because she's confident about her skills, and that's great. And as a budding chess player, it's just good for you, right? Anytime you get to play a player like Li Chao, you're gaining valuable experience that you really don't get very often, right? If you're 23, 40, and you're playing all these tournaments around the world, how often do you get to play a Super Grandmaster? Almost never, except for maybe the first round in a big open tournament where the pairings work, where you miss the cut and play up. So Indeed. it is very valuable experience for the other Ana. Yes, and that's why the Pro Chess League is such a great competition and the favorite event of many players. 
because they get to have these chances. As you mentioned, they are facing some of the best players in the world as board fours or board threes of their teams, things that can never happen, especially when you see Fabiano or Caruana playing on board one for the Archbishops. And how often do you get to play against Fabiano? Or how often do you get to see him in person and take a selfie with him? Me personally, or are you talking about <laughs> the general Just general, you? general. Oh, well, I mean, I can take a selfie with Fabi any time. Uh, I'll call him You're up. an insider. <laughs> you're an insider. That doesn't count. Yeah, I, I never count. But you're absolutely right that that experience is certainly invaluable and nobody can just go and play Fabiano. It's you know, They play in these closed tournaments often where they're only playing the other best players in the world. And well, Speaking of chess, I do like this bishop b5 check move that Anna Sargsyan just played. Because I like it too. Now you're saying, what are you going to do? If you put your knight on c6 or on d7, then my knight can jump into e5 with a big threat with this knight pinned here. And so you're putting black on the defensive. If you play knight to c6 instead, you still have to worry about jumps with knight to e5. And okay, rook to c8, but then you have to evaluate how do all these trades impact the position? Does it favor white, or is black just okay with the trades? And also this queen jumping over to g4, it feels like an attack is, is brewing here. I like that after knight e5, white has the possibility of going queen g4, already threatening the g7 pawn. And if you castle king side after the queen, ooh, that's <laughs> surprising. Yeah, I love it. You said castle king side, and then you're like, oh, just kidding. That king is just moved. Wow. What do you make of a move like this where you know, perhaps the pin was so frustrating that you decided just to move the king over? But do you think he's taking unnecessary risks in this position as black? A little bit. It does feel like... Already his opening choice, d4, b6, that was uh, what we described as that's when you know that a higher rated player is trying to beat you with the black pieces. And king f8, wow, he's not allowing the trade of pieces, the multiple trades that you were describing after a move like knight to c6, knight e5, rook c8. And instead he, go he doesn't mind that he cannot castle. I mind. I don't know I would you. mind I, it too. And, and I like this move bishop e3 as well because if you capture on e3, I take back with this f pawn. And I'm capturing towards the center, but I'm also opening up my rook to your king. Mm -hmm. And that might be the type of imbalance that Li Chao wants, getting a bishop for a knight and saying, now we're not just going to have the same pieces on the board and that could cause some confusion. But Ana Sargsyan is playing quickly and playing very well. So I like how she started this game. It's very easy for white to develop and play. As black, you have to worry, oh, are my pawns weak? If I ever push b5, I'm going to be met by a quick a4. Of course, immediately c5 is hanging. But the point is, in a future b5, do I have to worry about a4 or c4 just opening up that side of the board, especially with this king stuck on f8? I agree with you. I was going to ask you, what do you think will be the story for this king how can black connect his rooks? I honestly, I just had, I just can't wait to be king stuck in my head when you <laughs> ask me the question. But right now, I love the Disney reference. Uh, I mean, I don't know where it is going. It's a great question because if you go g6 and try to go king g7, there's always this bishop h6 maneuver. If I go f6, then I really have to be concerned about my e6 mm -hmm. pawn, and the queen's already lined up on it. But maybe some kind of f6, king f7. I really don't like it. I don't like that strategy because you loosen the light squares around your king. I just don't like Black's position. I agree with you that I wish that he could have castled. He did not like the the position of the bishop b5, knight c6, so he went for king f8. But we, we shall see how Lee Chao will manage to develop the rooks oh. and get his king safer. Oh, g3, yeah. opening up the long diagonal. That's also a move that I was not expecting. Yeah, it's covering the f4 square from a knight jump. But that bishop on b7, it's the opposite of a French bishop, isn't it? I know. <laughs> wait, wait. Hey, why do I let you troll me again about the French defense? And you said, I know. You didn't even... Yeah, it was too bad, too bad. I went with the flow. You're just so accustomed to me making fun of it. That now uh, you're just like, oh, keep I keep trolling me, yeah. Queen c6, immediately pointing at the weakness on the long diagonal. Why did she go g3? I'm a little bit puzzled. Was she afraid of knight f4? Well, you know, we have this great technology that helps us get insights to what the players are thinking. Mm -hmm. So instead of me trying to make up something, we can figure out, well, what are the players looking at? It's a really cool feature that we've added this year for the Pro Chess League where the eye tracker will show uh, who's thinking on which side of the board and are they th having the same thoughts as their opponent. It's, it's a really unique element to the show this year. I can't wait to see the blue ghost and who is looking where. Yeah, I, I know that I'm just looking down this diagonal. That's really <laughs> what I'm looking down. That's a queen and bishop battery. I'm looking at queen h1 mate or queen g2 mate. Bishop b4, that's a good move because she's preventing all sorts of danger on the long diagonal. As we were pointing out, the queen bishop battery that black was building up, queen on c6 and bishop on b7. Woo! <laughs> yeah, we are getting a little shocked here about the, the position. 
king on f8, and then you push f5. And that just leaves the e5 square behind. So if this knight ever moves from d7, and that's sort of the point, that if knight f6 was played, knight e5 would have been a jump with a tempo, attacking the queen on c6, and then the bishop would retreat to uh, g2. And we have, oh, all the games are underway now, so we can go over to Zavin's game against Zhang Di. I think that's a good place to go, just because we always want to see how the youngster is doing. And, well, Zavin is up on the clock right now. And, well, Zhang Di, we saw this yesterday against Georg Meyer when Zhang Di had the white pieces. He goes for the setup with the bishop on g2. But I'm very curious how Zavin is thinking here and what he's trying to accomplish with the black pieces where not much has been traded. The queens are going to stay on the board and he's going to outplay them. And given we have the eye tracking device that we were just talking about. And the blue ghost. I love it. I, I have never seen the eye tracker in action before this event and I must say I'm impressed. It's funny how that blue dot is jumping around. That's what Zavin Andrasian, the player with the black pieces here, board one of the Armenia Eagles is looking at. So he's clearly thinking about the center, whether he should push e4, that could be one option. And what's going to happen about this d file where white has already placed his queen and the rook, this knight on d7 being pinned at the moment. Yep. And we see that, oh, now here comes... I love it. We can see from their screen. So it hasn't oh. been played yet. And I <laughs> That's actually really cool to see that he's thinking about it. There, he finally plays it. And that happens all the time in chess, right? Where we know we want to make a move or, or we think we want to make that move. And we mm -hmm. kind of hover over the piece, hold your hand over it, and then finally you do it. And Wow, look at it sprinting to the corner. Where, where's it going? Yeah, what is he looking at? I think he wants to start a new game. <laughs> Or maybe he's just checking his playlist. Sometimes it happens that the players would bring up their playlist during yeah, the, the game. They can choose their own music. So every player here at this eSports chess event, they are wearing noise cancelling headphones. They can choose between white noise, classical music, pop music. They can basically listen to anything they like. I'm not sure if they would be allowed to listen to Robert Hess podcast, but maybe that's an option too. That sounds like miserable listening for all. And I'm just fascinated by what Zavin is thinking because I saw some ideas where going E4, actually let's flip the board because we're looking at this from uh, Zavin's perspective, right? We have the eye tracker on him and he's trying to think about E4, Knight E5. Of course, you mentioned you can't do that with the pin down the D file, but it's very clear what his intentions are. And with e the move E4, that bishop on G7 breathes new life on the really long diagonal. Your opponent doesn't have a dark score bishop, so that can wreak havoc on the board. How do you like this position after F5 and knight H4, king to H7? It's a bit risky because you know, if something happens in the light squares, your king is protecting a pawn that's pretty advanced. So there are no sacrifices in this current position, but that's uh, there we go. E4 is attacking that setup here and saying, well, if you go F, well, you go, you can go F4, right? That pawn can push there. The downside of pushing F4 is what's your next move going to be? Because if you ever take me, I'm very happy as white to just take back with my pawn. And if you just leave your pawn trying to go G5, well, then look at your light squares over here on the king side. Indeed, that would weaken very much the F5 square and the king itself on H7. I'm a little dubious. I think this is a bit dubious how Zaven has been playing the opening. It sometimes happens when you're the higher rated player and you want to beat your opponent with the black pieces. You've got to take risk. You see that the rating difference between these two players is over 600 rating points. That's huge in chess. So we have a world-class player, 2600 grandmasters, Zavin Andrasian with the black pieces, facing a 12-year-old boy who is not even 2000 rated at the moment. But with children, you can never know what their strength is. He clearly plays way better than his rating. And he's beaten several grandmasters for the names of which he doesn't even remember because he just focuses on the board so much. And I want to go over this game between Shant Sargassian uh, very quickly over here because in this game, we see that he's against Wang Yue. Look at this bishop on b4. Oh, that's going to be trapped, it feels like. A3 is the threat, and the bishop has nowhere to go. Yeah, and let's start back at the opening, because there was a early bishop B4 check, mm -hmm. and the bishop went to D2. And what generally happens, if you don't take me on D2, and you leave my bishop there, well, it's no longer pinned. My king's no longer on E1, so I'm going to move it out to F4. In this case, often you can move to G5. But after 96, C5 came on the board, and that's a bishop that's in enemy territory and about to be trapped via A3. Was this a blunder by Wang Yuan, not minding that his bishop will get stuck on b4? a3, the only way I see that the bishop can survive would be to create a space for it on a5, pushing a4. But that pawn is a dead pawn on a4. Yep. You can play a3 and then capture on a4, for instance. 
that yet. A3, bishop a5, queen a4, because you can't even take this pawn now with your bishop hanging here. And b4 is a renewed threat. And it, mm -hmm. this just looks... Isn't it pawn. just curtains? I mean, m let's just have a look at it one more time. But f first impression is that Wang Yuan may have missed the idea of pushing c5 and that the bishop is in trouble on b4. Yeah, it's, it looks like it's just going to be traps. So let's see if there's any way to get out of it. A a3, obvious threat. So let's see... You know, let's take a breath. Yoga collective classes, breath. Yes. And that's uh, collective breath for all Shangdu pan panda fans. Because I called it pans because I was trying to say panda fans. Pa yeah, panda th fans. I like it. Pans. Yeah. And so A3 traps this bishop. So what else can you do besides A4? I, I mean, B takes C5. Looks like you win a pawn. But, well, A3 still traps the bishop. So mm -hmm. that doesn't help. And you're right. A4 looks like the only move. And, I mean, at the very least, I could just do something like this. I'm up a pawn. And I have a great position. At the very least, yes. At the very least. But I like your line with A3 first. And it goes to show that, well, you need to really keep an eye out. And <laughs> look how cool he is right now. He's just, I think your bishop's in trouble, man. Yeah, 16 year old Chan Sergis and board three of the Armenian Eagles about to take down board two of the pandas. If this is true, that the bishop is in deep trouble on B4. Look at Wang Yuan not believing what's happening on the board. I mean, I can't believe it either. He's such a strong player, he's very experienced, and yet. His bishop on before is not having a good time. He's the only player from the pandas who was here last year, and he's shaking his head. He clearly missed c5, and that his bishop will be in deep, deep trouble, meaning that he can only bail out by pushing a4, but that will mean the loss of the pawn, and the position is still bad. The, p the bishop on a5 will still get trapped. I feel like this is game over. Yeah, if you can get this b4 move in very quickly, this bishop is still stuck here. I guess bishop c6 can be played, and I drop to c2, and now I can... Wait, but this bishop still has nowhere to go. Like, if I take here, b4 is still a threat. This is it. Yeah, I mean, wow. maybe, you may have to play some kind of bishop e4, or the queen moves back, say, to c1, and then c6, but this is so ugly. You, you know, Not only are you down a pawn, there's a lot of weak squares left in the position. This is a huge mistake if he doesn't come up with something. We don't find a way for him. It, there may be a miracle escape that we are missing. We are not using a chess engine to know what the best line is for black. But from what we have analyzed, it does seem like black has blundered this. He's an Olympic champion. Wang Yue is a world-class player. He's got a gold medal with the team of China at the Chess Olympiad. And here he is blundering this motif. This is move... What move are we? Move, move nine. nine. Yep. It's at such an early stage, at this high level between super grandmasters, you don't see a mistake like this. Yeah, no, I, I want to go back and explain how something like this happens. Because uh, I mentioned just before that this bishop is pinned to the king on e1, right? And that means you can't move your bishop away. You can't put your king in check. After castles, castles, if you go for the c5 move, it doesn't work because I can take your bishop. So I go bishop f4. And my opponent makes a move like that. I ask myself, what is my bishop doing on b4? Well, it's stopping rook e1. Maybe if the knight goes to c3, I'll take it. And you think, your first thought is, oh, after a3, then I'll move my bishop mm -hmm. back. But then you make a sort of careless move like knight a6, and then you're like, well, I want to move my bishop back eventually, but now <laughs> it's cut off. So I think you have to kind of train yourself to really think at every single move what new possibility is made by your opponent's last move. We can't just be stuck in our regular plans. We have to think, how has the position changed? Are there any tactics available? And why did my opponent do what he just did? I agree with you. This was an oversight by Wang Yue. He is clearly not happy with the situation. I, I understand. This is just such a blunder. A 2700 Grandmaster doesn't usually make mistakes of this kind. And we shall see if he finds a way out. At least maybe a pawn or two down. That would be still better than losing his bishop. But that bishop doesn't look like it's going to survive too much longer. And I, it looks like the 2700 duo from Shang Du is having a rough go of it because I just saw the corner of my eye this game between Anna uh, Sargassian and Li Chao. And this king is still on f8. Mm -hmm. The c file is open, and there's a rook staring down at a queen. This diagonal that you've been trying to checkmate me on is not really panning out to anything because I have a knight on f3 blocking the diagonal, but I also have a knight protecting it. So the question now is after bishop g5, which is... A super risky looking, but what? Wait, what if I? If you take on g5, where do I? Where does, where does this go? Because Ouch. this looks scary. 
it is really scary. So what Robert is describing here with those nice arrows and the knight jump, that if the knight from d5 could go somewhere with the tempo, such as knight to f4 or knight to c3, it means that black is threatening mate on g2 and on h1. So let's see a move like knight f4 or knight to c3. What? Oh, right. I There's still queen f3. I guess. Yeah, you knight f... I Block the diagonal. I offer a queen trade, but that's so scary to me. I don't. I don't think I could voluntarily walk into this. And what? Look at this move. Takes takes c d four, and that was played pretty quickly. This pawn takes d four. I guess Li Chao thought about it on his previous move, but now Li Chao is walking into a discovery of his own. So both sides clearly unafraid in this position. I guess Black is just taking this pawn and trying to run with it. But something concerns me about the fact there's a king on f8, and if white can close this diagonal somehow, then white is going to be the one with the initiative here. Yeah, I agree with you. His reasoning must be that he doesn't see any discovered attack with the bishop that would win material for white. For instance, if the bishop simply goes to b3 or d3, well, great, the queen will go away from the c file, and he's still a pawn up. The e6 pawn is defended, so for now there's no such thing as knight takes e6, and there's no immediate attack against the black king, even though it's uh, quite a funny place for the king. He couldn't castle earlier, and it's still a shaky kingside situation, but there's no attack against the f8 king as for now. Yeah, bishop d3 was just played, and it, I wonder if now the knight was going to happen, because there are tactics here. If knight f4 and I take your queen, once I take this queen, it's a check. So I will then pick up your rook next, and black will be up material. So after bishop takes, bishop uh, c6, black will be up in exchange. So um, in this position, knight f4 was played. Wh wh is this the game? An exchange up simply? Is that a... She accepted to lose an exchange. It's sort of like a positional sacrifice. Because, well, not positional, but y you're getting aggressive on the c-file. And if you could plant your rook on c7 and say, where's your knight going? That That's could be an exchange and a pawn. Yeah. Okay, but now so she's going to take on b5, she kind of has to, otherwise she's just spending time, and then Li Chao will coordinate his pieces, but after bishop takes pawn, t oop, definitely not there. <laughs> Mouse slip, which can happen in online yeah, we, competitions. We saw that happen yesterday, and uh, rook c7, but I guess this knight can just move out of the way, and yeah, this doesn't look like it's enough. I'm not buying this. I think she blundered the idea of the discovered attack when she went knight g5. Yeah, so okay. bishop g5, bishop takes, knight takes g5. Bishop g5 is basically the move that allows the tactical motive over the long diagonal. Yeah, it seemed like an unnecessary decision there. And she probably didn't know exactly what to do with sort of this tension on the diagonal, but also the tension in the central pawns. But yeah, bishop g5, that just... At first glance, I saw it coming out, oh, the king's NFA, it's open position. But then when I thought about it more, like, there's all these discoveries with this knight jumping away from d5. And after knight f4, you can't even block on f3 now. Because once I trade queens, you lose this bishop on d3. Mm -hmm. So the bishop is also on a bad square. Yeah, I'm afraid that this is a lost position for Anna Sergisian. She has been fighting so well. The position was really exciting. Li Chao had to go for king f8, which was a risk from his side. But then this queen bishop battery on the long diagonal was way too dangerous. And she, she went for it. She played g3 willingly, accepting that the light squares would be weak around her king. Well, yeah, that, that definitely was a decision that came back to haunt her. And it looks like Li Chao will take this one and the Shang Dupanis will get a first win. And let's take a look at the first game we looked at, which was Marty Rosian versus Zhao Jun. And a black's position looks much improved from where we saw earlier. Yes, uh, he has made a lot of progress. Our question earlier after the opening was whether Marty Rosian would accept that this is a solid position, he's playing with the black pieces. Is a draw enough for him or will he go bold? Will he try to create something? I think we got our answer. We see our, the H pawn already on H4, gaining more space on the king side. He has doubled his rooks in the C5, now jumping to E4 with the knight. So he's clearly taking the initiative and he's playing for a win even though he's got the black pieces. Yeah. Oh, I said he's playing for a win, but now he's going back to f6. Does he want to repeat moves? Maybe Let's for hope now, not. but there's Let's no need to. Not. Like With the rook on c3, knight e4 is not a forced move. So I think we'll see Hike consider other options. But I want to go to this game because what just happened? Knight g5 was played, saying you can't take my knight on g5 because your bishop mm -hmm. on b7 is hanging. And now bishop c6 was played on a defended square, which means that now your knight is in big trouble. Are you kidding? Is this an oversight now from White's side? Because earlier we saw Wang Yu are shaking his head, missing the c5 move, and his bishop on a5 is in trouble. But after bishop c6, you are right, Robert. The g5 knight is hanging. 
Yeah, I'll just put this on the board because the whole point was knight takes g5, bishop takes b7. I get your bishop just for my knight. I'm, I don't even think this necessarily is all that great because there's knight h3 check going after this bishop. So maybe knight g5 was just not the best decision at all. But What was, was wrong no with an immediate b4? That's my essential question as well. Perhaps the point was bishop takes, pawn takes, and knight takes c5. Oh. And then you have your rook hanging here on a1. But even something like this, what if I take... Take, rook takes. White has, what, two minor pieces and a rook for a queen? That's mm -hmm. clearly advantageous for for white there. Um, so This game is so puzzling. I feel like we are looking at this game yes. where both Wang Yu at 2,700 GM, so his rating was about 2,700, and still he's clearly a very strong player. He missed the idea of C5 on move 9 at the very early age of the game. Then, if this is true that Shant has missed that after Bishop c6 his knight is in trouble, both players are making really big mistakes for their s strength. It's not normal to see blunders like this at such a high level. Is this the morning round? Is it too early for the chess players? Are they awake, Robert? Uh, I, you sound like you are just reading into my soul. Like, I'm Robert, talking you don't about have myself too. It's too early. You're like Robert. You don't have enough energy right now. <laughs> are you awake? Yes, I'm awake. The players are awake. And they're excited to play, but something has gone wrong for Armenia in these games. Both Sargassians had very lovely-looking positions, and this one is just crumbling because you can still go for b4, and I think that's what uh, Shant is going to hope for is, let's say, I don't really want to take your knight on g5, but I'm worried that any time I trade here, this knight h3 check, knight takes f4 is going to ruin my structure. But let's say I go b4, and you can go after my, my bishop. That's fine. But how do we evaluate this position where the bishop is still trapped on a5? So I'm getting my piece back. Mm -hmm. And that obviously is a good thing for black. But at the same time, I'm sorry, that's a good thing for white to get the piece back. But black looks totally fine to me, at least at first glance. Yes, and it's going to take some time for white to capture the bishop on a5. So you're going to waste some tempi and not develop the b1 knight and the a1 rook in the meantime. Well, b4 was played immediately, saying, I'm not going to give any 9 3 mm -hmm. check. That's probably more precise. And, okay, that bishop is lost. White is going to regain the material. So perhaps Sean's position, despite that shocker of a blunder with knight to g5, is still very playable with uh, material equality going to be restored soon. But it's going to be material equality instead of having a piece up. If he did not play knight g5, wasn't it the case that simply he would have had either a piece up or he would have had to give up his queen for a rook and two minor pieces. You know, I've been told somewhere that you want to take on someone your own size, and I guess you want to take on someone with the same amount of pieces as you. That that seems like the chess analogy here. He's like, I don't need that extra piece. I can beat you with equal material. That that at least is the hope. And I'm going to swing back to the game between Zavin Andreasian and Zhang Di because, I mean, look at the light squares. The 95 is great. You are going to play c6 very soon as black, but this bishop on g7, right, that is a bishop that could use an open diagonal. It could use an open diagonal. It, it dreams not. about that a e5 pawn not being on the board. Oh, that would be very wishful thinking here. And I like this move c5, taking space on the queen side. And now if you play c6, my knight can even consider just jumping right into the d6 square. My rook could use that square as well. I love Zhang Di's position. And it went from me thinking that Armenia was doing exceptionally well to all of a sudden um, Li Chao wins his game no longer is Wang Yue going to be down a piece. And this game here, has, uh, the other game has one minute left for both sides. So I think we'll stick here, if, if that suits you. Sure. I mean, Black's position, Marty Rosen still doing well. And this might be the game Armenia needs. They badly need this. And what a turn of events, as you described. Anna Sergisian lost her game from a position that we thought was suspicious for Li Chao. Wang Yue was about to lose a piece, and now it's equal material. So we are left with Marty Rosian trying to win this position with the black pieces. It's not easy because white's position is very solid. Very, very solid. And I guess after knight b4, do I take and go queen to c1? I always want to you know, pin a bishop on the, the first rank. Or do I play a sneaky move like queen c3, forcing the queens off, and there's a problem on the a4 square. So that's why in the game, instead of playing knight before, queen e2 is played, but that's a weird move. I understand you might want to come for my pawn at some point, but you can't really do that with your knight trapped on a2. 
Indeed, and how do you react to bishop to c6, the pawn is hanging, alright, queen c4 has been the answer, but after queen d7, the threat is renewed, and you can't play knight c3, it's going to be taken, and the pawn falls. It's going to be a pawn up for Marty Rostian, so good chances in the end game. Uh, I like this move knight to b4, though. It's saying that if you take on b4 and try to take a4, you lose b6, now we're just in equal yeah, position. Yeah, I did not see that come in, and if he doesn't take on b4, bishop takes a4, then knight takes d5, and queen takes d5. But this might give black some outside chances. At least. Pass pass pawn. Pawn, but at the same time, now your pawn f7 feels weaker if this bishop can line up with the queen. But I actually like black's chance in a position like that, especially in the time closure. Here it comes. He he went for it. He sees this team situation. 20 seconds left for Zhao Jun. Wow. Uh, oh, this is going to be really tough for white. When you, I know that... Oh, okay, I thought queen a check was the... <laughs> a piece was hanging, but the queen protects it. So bishop c4 goes after f7, prevents b3, e4. Oh, that's a great queen transition for G5. him. He was about to capture on G6. So the threat of the queen G5 was queen takes G6 because of the pin on the A2 G8 diagonal. But bishop takes E4, captures the pawn, D5. and defends G6. Go D5. Shut this bishop down. Protect your bishop on E4 and try to make use of this pawn. Oh, that's also a good-looking move because now the bishop is defended. This bishop's attacked. The G2 square is under attack. And this pawn wants to start rolling. I love... Oh, four seconds. Three seconds. Two. Two seconds. One. Does he even know he's, he's losing time? Oh, he made that with 0.8 seconds Jeez. left. Oh, gosh. B bishop F1. But look at this B-pawn. And B -pawn. the B-pawn will promote. I think this is it. Queen B7. Yeah. You can't stop the B-pawn with only your queen. Bishop D5, was that needed? Queen B7 I liked more. Uh, yeah, I thought transition to a queenless endgame would help you win, but this decision also um, clearly good for black. And now, you have some time as Marty Rosen. You have no time. Oh, is there a perpetual? King H7? He gave up the D-pawn. King H7, and then this... Indeed. King H7 and the bishop drops, plus the B-pawn will still promote. Marty Rosen winning the first game for the Armenia Eagles. And we hear we hear the celebration downstairs for Armenia Eagles. They brought a lot of supporters here, and that was a huge win for Marty Rosen. And we saw him breathe a sigh of relief, and that was really nice. He decided, okay, my pawn structure might be compromised, but I'm going to push this B pawn down the board and try to get a queen. So that's a win for Armenia, and just the one they needed. Let's go to the game between. Well, let's go to the game where we were looking at earlier with Sean Sargsyan and Wang Yue. It almost feels like. They're purposely not moving. Like, I, I expected to be here. Many moves had been made. That something, you know, something happened. Clarification with this bishop on a5. I think they just haven't got their Starbucks coffees yet. I mean, they are so slow. This is only move 16, and they are running out of time. It's three and a half minutes for Sargisian and Wang Yue down to four minutes. Can someone please wake the players up? I mean, I think they want you to wake them up when it's all over. And when they're wiser and they're older. But what, speaking <laughs> of wiser and older, Zhang Di is getting great experience here. And look at that knight on d5. Look at this rook on d3. The other rooks come in d1. And what do you make of the queen on g8? I think that's a funky piece. You don't really want to have your queen on g8. But hey, I, I like the geometry there. <laughs> this, is, this does not look good at all. No, <laughs> it's terrible. What, what, what is it doing here? I, I, it sort of protects the uh, pawn on g6. I don't know what else it's doing because the queen was on e6 before, so it was voluntary. This queen went to g8, and I don't know how to explain it. And Zhang Di has a great opportunity to get a 2,600-plus uh, victim. The scop of yeah. the, a super grandmaster. As we know, he, he just beats grandmasters on a regular basis, so it may be not so special for him, but he's a 12-year-old boy with a rating of... 1966, so that's a 600 rating point difference between the two players. And he's playing great. White is having a very nice position. The initiative, better piece places, active pieces. The king on h7 is dubious. The queen on g8 is the most passive piece I've seen in recent uh, times. And uh, I just really don't know what I can say about black's position. Well, speaking of recent time, or just time, look at the clock situation, though. Do you think that gives Zavin oh. good chances because he's up nearly a minute on the clock? His position is not very good. But it's not like there's a breakthrough here. And that's a problem because, oh, speaking of not being a breakthrough, G4 was played by Jean wow. D. Clear intentions to swing this rook over to H1 and mate this king on H7. So if you take on G4, I don't even need to take back. I'm just going to rook H1. Then I'm going to take, and your king might just get mated. 
No, that would be game over. You cannot allow the h5 to be opened when the king is on h7. He plays queen f7 to create some space for the king on g8, but this is looking bad for Zavin Andresian. Top board of the Eagles going down against board four of the Pandas. Can it be the story? It looks like it should be the story, but I'm worried about the... I love it. Patience. Rook h1, because you could have taken on h5, but that might give this knight the g6 score eventually, because that knight's not doing anything. By waiting, you can take next, and once this pawn takes, my knight can swing into f5. Plus, this rook is helpful here. If there's ever a check on the g file, my king can go to f1 without boxing my rook in on, on the other side of the board. So he might even ignore this. If you take on d5, maybe take back with the pawn. So... Maybe just go after the h5 pawn. He plays rook f3 to attack the queen and then goes back to e3. As He's Robert said, it a may great not. Game. Yeah, this this knight maneuver playing first rook f3 so that the rook would not be cut out of the game. And sometimes he can consider taking on h5. Also, the knight coming to f5, rook to g3. This oh looks like gosh. game over. He essentially brought both his rooks to the king side. This rook to g file, this rook on the h file. I don't even know which knight belongs in f5, but there's going to be a party on that score. That's an outpost for the ages. And even if we trade off all the pieces except for my knight against your bishop, white's like strategically winning with that outpost in f5. Even in an end game, but I don't think that Zavan will get to play an end game. Although now he's threatening knight f4. So there's finally a threat for yes. black, a huge one, winning the queen. White cannot take on h5 because of knight f4 check. King h2. You didn't want your king on the h file blocking your rook's axis, but you've opened up the g file. Mm -hmm. And so that was a necessary decision by Zhang Di here. I, I, maybe he put the wrong knight on f5 after all because the knight on h4 stopped the knight from going to g6. But I still like the position. There's an attack that's gaining momentum here. And rook g1 is a deadly threat. He may have missed the knight coming in with knight g6, knight f4, but still looking good for white. Very simple chess right now. And if you take, I could even consider taking with the pawn. Because if I take with the pawn, your h5 pawn might fall down. And I guess you can go knight e6. So I don't love it quite as much as I thought I would. But still, I can just take on g7 point. Other knight on f5. It's good for white pretty much regardless. He takes with the queen. Going right for the g7. Knight e2 is a fork that doesn't work out. I don't think at least. Because knight e2 I think I take here. And now your queen's hanging. Yes, and if rook takes g7, queen takes g7, mate. Can we have a look at the blue ghost? Do you think we can bring it back? Because we ha we do have the eye tracker on Zavin Andresian playing this game with the black pieces. Yeah, it would be fascinating to see how Zhang Di is thinking about this. And, you know, he's calculating very well. The time situation still concerns me, but he's playing such accurate chess. Going, going for this enemy king and rook g3. Is there some bishop f6? Where, where's the queen going? Oh, no. <gasps> oh no. No. He trapped his queen. Oh no. He trapped his own queen. Oh. <gasps> queen was trapped, so he had to give up peace for it. Now, all of a sudden, Zavin with oh. the swindle of the day. And that's super upsetting because this kid played so exceptionally well. And I, I was like asking the question wait, where's the queen going? And Bishop F6 was played. There was nowhere to go. This is very upsetting. What a sad story. He played so well. We, we can't root for anyone as commentators, but you must give credit to the 12-year-old boy here with the white pieces outplaying a 2600 GM, and then he blunders in one move. He blundered the game away. Yeah, that is very sad. And, you know, He looks very upset, honestly. I, I'm upset for him. I, I've lost many games in similar fashion where... Oh, that was a, a really, Heart really break. great game by Zhang Di. And, you know, this is the Constellation match. I was going to say there's... No consolation prize, but honestly, you should he should keep that game with him forever, and we should just scroll back very quickly before we go into the next game. This might be the game that costs the pandas. If we see a close match at the end, mm -hmm. and we'll say this is the game that got away because rook g3 actually took the queen square away, and after rook g3, bishop f6 came, this queen was out of options. Oh, I mean, it's painful. So we're going to have to move to the last game where Sean Sargassian, now we're in a rook end game where... It's even material after all that. Oh, <laughs> we thought that he would have, he was about to lose a piece. Wang Yue with the black piece is a move nine. He was about to lose a piece. Then Shan Sergisian may have blundered back with knight g5. And now this is a rook end game. What a story. Yeah, I, I still can't believe it. Tragic right, comedy. I, and right now, black has won every game in the round so far. Li Chao yeah. won with black. Um, 
Hike Martirosin won black. That was a really pivotal game because of the two evenly rated Grandmasters. And right now, Wang Yue is trying to show off his endgame technique and try to get this one with black. But the problem is, one, this H4 pawn is one or too far. So it might be white who's about to go up a pawn by just going here. And then there's this outside pawn that you have to deal with. So if you go King G4, take this pawn on H4, then I might just run my king back this way and try to get to the, the queen side. I don't really see an exact journey there, but it is just wishful thinking that I'm trying to make happen. I think it's happening. White is capturing the h4 pawn right now. The oh, only thing is that move. the king is cut on the g file. The, ki the king can't move, and if you move your rook here, or something like that, I just go after this pawn. If you go a4, I go rook to a2. So actually, rook a2 will be played, and I'm, I'm assuming they're going to shake hands very soon because three pawns on three pawns on the same side of the board, this is about to fizzle out to a draw. And that will mean a great round for the pandas. It looked very good for the eagles at the beginning of the round, but in the end, it's going to be two and a half, one and a half, a point lead for the Chinese team. I've learned now just not to make any predictions <laughs> because I, I think every single game, I, I expected something and the other thing happened. Except in this game, I, I thought, well, we if thought that one game If this is not the draw, <laughs> I think we should give back our commentator titles, the titles that we unofficially have. Yeah, I don't want to do that, so please make <laughs> a draw. Uh, yeah, they're just going to shuffle around the board. At some point, Black is going to rook f4. Wait, now this king. Wait, what? Isn't this king just running here? Is rook f2? Oh, uh, you don't want to calculate that with no time. I shouldn't have said that about the title. Yeah, you. So can someone from the audience <laughs> replace us in about uh, five <laughs> minutes because we have lost, just lost our jobs? Well, we're supposed to be analyzing, not prognosticating, so we're okay. Okay, We're I'm okay. very bad at predicting. That's why yeah. I, I don't play lottery or anything. H5, That's about you gotta prediction. take it. Rook takes. Now king takes e4. Black's up a pawn. Now king f5 is coming. And this, okay, king f5 n is stopped for this time, but this e pawn. Gotta try to roll with it. I like this defensive setup right now by uh, Shant because he's making it very difficult for Black to push the pawn. If you move the rook away from f4, then this rook can just come to f6. So he's going rook f1. I would go. If a king g2, there's rook f5, and I'm trying to take this pawn with checks. So king g4 up, but e4 now. Mm -hmm. Just push that pawn. Okay, so moving the king first. I'm trying to. The king is cut off. This king is cut off, which means that. Oh, king f5 now. Uh oh. Uh oh. Ooh, and the g pawn drops as well back. I mean, oh, this, he's taking it with the rook so that the e5 pawn is defended, and this is a winning position now for Wang Yue. We thought he was about to lose a piece at the beginning of the game after a blunder. He was shaking his head, and now he's two pawns up in this rook end game. It's an easy win. Oh, Sean's really upset. Like, super upset. Oh. He can't believe it. He spoiled his game after a winning position in the opening. Wang Yue wins. This is 3-1 in favor of the Chengdu Pandas. What a round, Robert. Yeah, the only consistency we had there was Black winning every single game and craziness across the four boards. So we just had an absolutely wild round. It is 2-2. Two to two. At first we thought that Arme no, yeah, Armenia was going to do really well. Then we thought Shangdu was going to re do really well. And then it's 2-2 two, two tie. And in the end, it's... yeah. It, it doesn't even matter? No. But the Pandas have won... So many games in the end. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, from especially this game, I can't believe that this is the game where, like, blundered c5, the bishop was trapped on b4, then this knight g5, we didn't really understand why Shant would go for it, and in the end, he loses the game with the white pieces. I understood very little about what happened this round, <laughs> so I think that means we should take a quick break. We should get some water or some food, hopefully. Some bagels. And I need to calm myself down because I'm really just jittery about what just happened. So oh, I also can't digest it. I couldn't add up the numbers. I think I said 3-1. I'm even confused about the score because I still can't digest what happened over the board. This has been such an exciting <laughs> first round. Three more to go between the Chengdu Pandas and the Army Negos. Stay here. We are back in a few minutes. The most elite event in online chess returns with more than $100,000 in prizes, the Speed Chess Championship is bigger and better than ever. As players try to qualify their way in through the women's and juniors field, we take a look ahead and see who's on deck waiting amongst the seated players. Of course, right there at the top, you have defending champion Hikaru Nakamura. He'll face a familiar cast of foes in guys like Jan Napomniashi, Alexander Grishuk, Jan Christoph Duda, and more. But perhaps his biggest challenger will be a brand new player in the field, 
currently the world number three and the top chess player from China, Ding Li Ren at 28.09 looks to make his SCC debut a memorable one. Look ahead and mark your calendars for November 29th through December 1st, where the semifinals and finals will happen. You can follow all the action at twitch.tv slash chess, chess.com TV, or go to speedchesschampionship.com to stay up to date with all the latest news and info. Be sure to fill out your fantasy bracket and try to predict who's going to win this year's Speed Chess Championship, and we'll see you on chess.com. I'm here with NFL legend John Urschel. He's also a chess player. He's also getting his PhD in mathematics at MIT. I don't know which one of those is the most impressive. Probably the fact that he could do push-ups with people sitting on his back. John, I heard that you flew here just yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I was in uh, D.C. at the National Math Festival yesterday, and Danny convinced me to come out. And I'm happy to be here. It's been, uh, it's been enjoyable so far just meeting everyone in person. What did Danny have to do to convince you to come all the way here? Well, all he did was tell me how many of my friends were going to be here. You know, like you, like Hess, like Anna. So uh, I've been enjoying it so far. What have you been enjoying the most about it since you got here? I think one of the coolest things about being here in person is that, you know, online as a Twitch community, you meet a lot of people, but you don't really put a face to the name. And to be able to come here and interact with sort of the chess Twitch community, as well as sort of see all the players that, you know, that you see on TV, I think it's, uh, it's a really an amazing thing. And I would highly recommend next year people coming here in person. It's a great, it's a great environment. If John said it, you have to be here next year. John, you've done a weekly stream with Anna for almost two years now, but you guys have never met in person. Can you explain a little bit what it's like streaming with someone and feeling like you know them and never meeting them in real life? Yeah, it's interesting. So Anna and I were, you know, we're quite close. I mean, she's my coach and we, you know, we hang out every week. But I've never met her in person and, you know, she's up there doing commentary, but I'm, you know, I'm very much looking forward to it. I don't know. I don't know what that moment's going to be like. I don't know if it's going to be like like dirty dancing, like we're just going to see each other and I'm just going to lift her up. I don't I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go, so. I mean, that already happened with Danny Wrench earlier today. Yeah, so yeah, I already did this with this is how Danny and I meet each other every time we see. I'm not joking. He was holding Danny in his arms and Danny, like a little baby. Like a little baby. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, any last words as we send it up? Uh, I'm looking forward to the finals. I have to say I'm a little, uh, I'm a little torn because I'm a huge Jorg Meyer fan, but Fabi is one of my very good friends. So excited to see it. Thank you. Up to you, Robert and Anna. That has been my student, John Urschel. I can't wait to meet him in person. We are in the same building. <laughs> I've never seen you so happy when you have to sit next to me as when John <laughs> Urschel is complimenting you and excited to see you. Well, I, I can't wait for the Dirty Dancing moment, one of my favorite movies. Is that nobody's going to put you in the corner? Your references are way too classy for me. It's from Dirty Dancing. I know. Oh, okay. But I, I wanted to come back with another lyric line, and I'm not that good at lyrics. Gotcha. Well, I was worried that I, I did something wrong all no, of a sudden. No, I said, I said it's too good. I need to. I think for the next time we're going to commentate together, I'm going to look up all the lyrics from all the movies and songs that you like, and then I can come back with the right line. Okay. Well, we're going to come back to the action soon. We just saw the first round of the consolation match between the Shangdu Pandas and the Armenian Eagles. It was a two to two tie. It could have gone either way, and as we see the results that happened, Li Chao won his game against Anna Sargsyan. Wang Yue won that ending against Shan Sargsyan. He lost a piece early on, it seemed like, and then all of a sudden it was a crazy game and should have been a draw, but he won that one. Haik Martirosian played an excellent game as black against uh, Zhao Jun, and Zhang Di, that is the heartbreaker of the round. He should have won that game with Zavan Andreas, and he outplayed him from start to finish, and unfortunately he blundered in a critical moment, and that allowed the Armenian Eagles to tie the match 2-2. Two to two. And that's uh, what messed up my mats. I mean, John Urschel knows how bad my mats is, but I really thought that Zhang Di was on his way of winning that game. He had such a great position, and then he trapped his own queen. Sad story. Yeah, that was, a, that was really a tough one to see because he played such an excellent game, and he I mean, you can only say so many things about how excellent that was. He outplayed a 2600 Grandmaster from start to finish. It didn't even seem like a, for a moment that he was the weaker player. And of course, Zavin Andreasen, very resourceful defender, he managed to outlast him in the ending. 
Now we are on to the second round. Remember that there are four rounds in total. Everyone plays everyone. Here we see the matchups. Zenven Andresian facing Zhao Jun. Two grandmasters with a very similar rating. Our 12 year old boy Zhang Di is now against Haik Martyros in the current Armenian champion. Li Chao board one of the, China, uh, the Chengdu Pandas up against Shan Sergisian, who played a great game. We thought he was on his way of beating Wang Yi, but in the end, he didn't win the piece that we thought was about to be trapped and ended up losing a Rukan game. Yeah, in the final matchup we see there is Wang Yue playing against Anna Sargsyan. She also looked like she had a good position. She played G3, which opened up the long diagonal, and that really cost her. But this is a 2-2 match right now, and we are seeing that oh, the next game is underway. We have Shan Sargsyan playing with the black pieces against Li Chao. Tell us about this opening more, Robert. I know you are an expert. Well, I, I was purposely being silent so that you would <laughs> answer the opening question here. And look at this bishop d2 move. And that is typically not seen so early in these openings. I think that Li Chao has shown throughout the weekend that he's trying to get a position where there's not a lot of memorized theory and yeah, you're on your own. And bishop d2, the point is that you stop this pin on the knight on c3 and you protect the knight on c3. So uh, oftentimes you see black maybe go for a bishop takes c3 move, and you take with the pawn, which isn't the end of the world, and, and sometimes it benefits white, but the nuances there allow black counterplay on the queen side. And so bishop d2 here stops that pin, allows the knight to move if you so choose, and at some point black might want to take on c3 mm -hmm. and play knight e4, saying, I'm going to get your bishop anyway, but you always have to consider, is bishop b4 a good move, or, well, here particularly c5 would be a response, and doesn't look all that excellent, but... You, all, you can't just take on c3, hop on e4 without thinking about the consequences. And here, c5, a3 was played. So black is challenging white center. White is challenging black's bishop. And Sean Sergisian likes going... He, in the last game, he went after this bishop that went to a5. And here, it's traded off, so we'll never be in any trouble. I think he learned from his own game how unlucky those bishops on b4 can get. And he decides to take on c3, jump onto e4... White simply continues with rook c1. He doesn't mind that knight takes c3 will come because he's ahead in development. So knight takes c3, rook takes c3. And white enjoys a slightly better position because of the developed pieces. At the same time, his king is still in the middle of the board. So he's going to take some time moving the bishop out and costing king's side. Absolutely. And these games are often either drawn or an advantage is won based on the tempo. And when you say, okay, white is ahead in development, white has the knight and the bishop developed and the rook on c1. So if you take this knight off the board at one of your developed pieces, and now my rook is more active, and you say, okay, there's a huge tension in the center, and we'll see how that clarifies. But black is a, you know, one move away. If they get uh, white waste a move somewhere, then black is totally fine. That's often how these positions go. But what I mean by that is, like, let's say I take on d4. I, I guess I'm taking with the pawn here, and this rook at some point can swing over to the king's side. Because if I take with the queen, well, then knight c6 comes, and I have to move my queen. If I take with the knight, ah, at some point black can play e5, or can even consider just taking on c4. I, I wouldn't, in general, take on c4 too early, because you want white to develop this bishop first. So if, if, when you see this pawn tension, it's not really like white is dying to take on d5 anyway, but if I want to say, let's make him with h6, then you play bishop e2, then I take, so that you've spent a move in the process to play bishop e2 and then capture on c4. And I hear that there's a great atmosphere downstairs. So I just wanted to say hi to everybody who came to see us in person at the Folsom Street Foundry. Can you please give us your biggest scream and cheer for the teams if you can hear us? Can we hear you loud <laughs> and clear? Everyone visiting us at the PCF Finals. Ooh, is this your loudest shout? Is it really? How loud can you get? I, I think it is. It's it. It's, it's, all, it's all they're giving you. This I, is it? I honestly was going to shout. Is this all I, I deserve? I was going to let it all out, but I just figured that it would be really loud and you wouldn't Oh, man, well. I feel like it's early even for our spectators. I mean, it's... Where's it, the coffee it, machine? It is Sunday morning. It is Sunday but morning. But hopefully the rain's not falling. Ah, uh, damn it. I, need, I really need to just... For next time, I will not look at any chess before the broadcast or not do any research on the players. I will just be learning lyrics. I think that's the best preparation for the working with you, Robert. I see the chat picking up on some of my lyrics, though, so it's working out very well. Yeah, I also get them, but I don't know how to respond to them. 
I mean, you're responding perfectly. You're by admitting that my lyrics are just poor. You're suggesting good like chess moves. References. That is the best response possible in my eyes. And right now, speaking of good chess moves, well, look what happened here. The queens got traded. Mm -hmm. So people often think, oh, well, the queens are traded. That means it's likely a draw, right? Less and experienced it's boring. Players. People it's boring. think it's boring. But when I look at a position like this, I see white has control of the C file, but black can counter on the C file very quickly with a move like rook to C8 because I have two defenders in the square. So even if this B5 move is eventually played, I'm well defended here. But if I'm white, I want to move my bishop away, play B5, and put my rook on C7. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the interesting thing about doubled rooks is let's say rook C8, bishop D3, just uh, to put my bishop here. And I say, oh, I'm worried about my pawn on H7. I'll go H6. And then once I play B5, and you move your rook, maybe, I assume you move your knight, I have this move rook c7, which is really annoying. It is, because if black takes on c7, here comes the second rook, and you can't challenge it with rook c8, the bishop on d7 is falling. And knight d5 looks like a great move since you're defended here, but I can remove the guard by going rook takes d7. And Beautiful. Saying, That's a piece that I've just captured, now our rooks are in a stare down, and you take one, I take the other, thank you for the extra piece. This is a really instructive tactical motive that you guys can learn from rook takes d7. If rook takes c1, the d8 rook is hanging, and if rook takes d7, the c8 rook is hanging, this is a piece up. Yep, so it looks like Li Chao should, and there it is, bishop d3. Mm -hmm. I think, I, am I playing this game? You are. <laughs> and Hopefully they cannot listen to us. No, no, they can't. They are listening to music. I wonder what kind of music is Lee Chow listening to at this moment. I think we should ask him later when we interview him. I Yeah, listening to me is just generally not a, a great idea. And I, But I was going to say your voice is music to their ears, so that oh, would be... Oh, that's too kind. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> Shout out to all my haters who hate my voice, too. Oh, whoa. <laughs> the haters do not exist, nor does the limit. We all have haters. Uh, I love them too. You know you're doing something right when you have haters. Isn't that I what they know. say? I know. That's why I like that I have haters. Well, let's go over to this game between Hike Marty Rosan because we're talking about haters, and someone who does definitely does not have haters is Zhang Di. And Zhang oh, Di is yeah. playing the black side of this opening. Hike Marty Rosan has experience with his knight a3 maneuver, which seems weird, and, we, and actually was just captured. But I'm going to scroll back to the beginning quickly. It's sort of the Levon Aronian. Um, opening. He's the hero, chess hero of Armenia. He is one of the world's premier players and has been for a long time now. He's led them to Olympiad golds. How many of them? Three? Um, good question. At least two. Um, I yeah, stopped counting I'm, after you one. Me so. here. You caught me here with how many golds, but yes, many. Yeah, and so w all the golds aside, you know, we can only have so much, but knight a3 is played because you protect the pawn c4, and if you want to take this knight, you have to lose your dark square bishop. And that can give white a lot of play in the future along the dark squares. It's a, uh, it's a sacrifice of a pawn right now, but more importantly, the positionally, it also looks bad for white. But as the game continues to open up, you have a dark square bishop, your opponent doesn't, and if the dark squares become vulnerable, you can take advantage of that. Indeed. And it's going to take some time to get that pawn back. So instead, what happened was... Yeah, we have missed a few moves. And this is the current position, knight yep. to d5. Pair of bishops for white, but right now you should decide whether you will allow the capture on f4. Knight takes f4, g takes f4, doubling the pawns, but that's a capture toward the center for which usually white would be happy or keep the bishop. And that's what Marty Rossian goes for, bishop to d2, aiming for e4 later on to chase that knight away from d5. And white has a marvelous center. Right? You have two central pawns, a d and an e pawn. Black only has one as pawn e6. Black's pawn structure is better. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes these pawns. Well, maybe, do you like those pawns? Nah, nobody. I would like it if that pawn was here. Mm, yeah, that would be a different story. But in general, doubled pawns are not that bad. We always say they have pros and cons, but these are doubled pawns and isolated pawns. So they don't have friends. It's just the a2 pawn and the a3 pawn on their own. Nobody can defend them. Should we keep talking about their loneliness uh, over here? No. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> but you know, you made a really good point about they are uh, isolated pawns, so you can't be protected by another pawn. But very importantly, it opens up files, right? Whenever you have double pawns, inherently you have a, uh, some kind of file next to it open. And here is the case where now the B file is open. And that doesn't look like a big deal right now because the bishop is protecting B7. But the B pawn also can't move because this is another open file where you have a pawn. Mm -hmm. So I think that white can try to get quick counterplay on the 
well, it's not really counter, but it's quick play on the queen side. And I actually do like it, an idea with a4 because if you have your opponent push to a5 himself, that pawn can become a target with my bishop staring at it. So e4, okay, it's very natural. It's the easy move to play. And I am very worried about Zhang Di's position. I think he's worried too. He's shaking his head a little, which I did not see earlier. Normally we see a very confident 12-year-old boy. He's the youngest participant at the PCF finals. And he played such brave, confident chess in all the previous games. As for now, I think that he is also concerned about this game. Well, how do you forget about what just happened? Right? It's how very difficult. That's, that's so difficult about chess. And I think not everyone sees what the players go through when they lose a game and a few minutes later they need to play another game or another game. Even when you play a classical tournament and you have then maybe about 20, 24 hours to forget about it until the next round. So you have a full day to recover if it's a classical tournament. Still, it is difficult. Here what we have at the PCL and at Rapid Events in general is that you need to forget about the game within just a few minutes. It's extremely difficult. Psychologically, I think the the psychological part of chess is something that is not that dis that it's not discussed that much, but I think it's key if Zhang Di can forget about that game and blundering his queen. So I know what he needs to do, and I'm asking the even harder question: How does he do it? Oh, I wish I knew it. See, that's why I don't compete. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, I definitely don't either, and especially it's difficult. As, as you said, you play back-to-back -back games, so you may have a couple minutes. Your teammates will give you some encouraging words. But chess players, we're supposed to have short memories, but we remember a lot, and yeah. we definitely remember our defeats. I just, you know, there's so much positive to take away from that game because he played so exceptionally well. But at the end of the day, we're very result-oriented, and so you're just upset that the result didn't go your way. I know, and I think there's a great parallel in the chat that's being discussed that also in poker it's very difficult when you lose a hand. I'm not a poker player, but I, I do understand that if you have just lost a hand and then you need to keep going, that must be difficult too. So poker and chess have quite, a, quite many similarities in terms of what the players go through and the strategies you need to imply. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think what I always say about chess and the uniqueness of it is it's so individualized mm -hmm. that when you lose a game, it's entirely your fault. And that's so difficult to yeah. digest. There's no one to blame. It's not the arbiter's fault who didn't call the yellow card. It's not your teammate's fault who didn't pass the ball. It's you. It's only you. Yeah, and even in poker, right, you can say, oh, that hand, you know. Yeah, there's it, no it, luck factor. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's full, complete information in front of you. So, yeah, that's it's really tough because there's a lot of uh, blame that you kind of internalize, and it's very tough to get rid of it. But Zhang Di right now will also probably want to forget about this game because there's a hole on d6, and there's a knight ready oh. to hop right into it. That's an outpost. That will be an octopus knight. So when the knight lands on d6, that's called an octopus. From a knight, it becomes an octopus. That's how powerful that piece is. I've never is. heard of that before. The octopus? Yeah. You're kidding. No. Is that a European thing? I thought it's an international thing. I love it, though. There are books about it, The Octopus Knight. I didn't, I didn't know that. I don't read books. Too okay. difficult for me. <laughs> but you do sing a lot. Um, let's, let's, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Can we swap and you read books and I sing more? Uh, that sounds great. People love my voice. We did a Twitch Sings uh, with Alexandra and everyone loved it. I love you. Yay! Reading. Well, I, I heard that. <laughs> that was Alex. That, that sounded like some bad singing. Oh, we are great. Everybody knows that we are the next... Ariana Grande. Oh, thank you. Next. Okay, I'm going on to the <laughs> next. <laughs> Finally, I get something right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go on to this game because we've seen Li Chao and Sean Sargsyan make a lot of progress. And look how much time Li Chao has. Do you think he'd be better suited to spending a bit more time instead of rushing through it? Because Maybe. Uh, I think White's slightly better. Mm -hmm. Right. You have this bishop. It's going to come to e4. Go after this b7 pawn. But black still looks very solid. And I can always stop your bit when your bishop gets to e4. I can throw my knight in on... Yeah, there it. goes the knight. There goes the knight. And now what are you going to do as white? You can throw in a rook c8 check. I'll go king to e7. I can sit my rook on d7. And the problem is your pawn and bishop can't share the same square. You would love to have like your bishop on e4. Okay, you play g3 to keep this protected, but put your bishop and your pawn there at the same time. So you kick the knight away and open the diagonal. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you ever go e4, well, you can't put your bishop on the square, obviously. So I, I don't really see... How Li Chao is going to make progress, but then again, I said that about the last end game we saw Sean Sargsyan play, and he lost that one to Wang Yue. But holding well thus far. That must be also very difficult for Sean, remembering that he had such a great position against Wang Yue, and now what he has is this position where 
yeah, he's okay, but he could have gotten more points for his team. Yeah, and he does look pretty composed. And look, we see Zhang Di in the background, so this makes a lot of sense that they, you know, they're commiserating. Hmm. They, they both are getting over a tough defeat together. And uh, Sean's an amazing player. Throughout the entire season, he was one of the biggest surprises and just one of the best re results. He was overperforming his rating by so much. It became clear that this is an exceptionally talented teenager from Armenia. And I also believe he and Hike Martyrson are very good friends because they're around the same hmm. age. So it's also nice to see. I, I saw them just walking around San Francisco and you know having a good time. So I, it's really nice to see that kind of not just being compatriots and being teammates, but being really close friends as well. Oh, that's great to hear. And in general, I have that impression of the Armenian team, the Olympic team of Armenia too. They always just hang out together. They are really good friends. And that's one of the key features of the Armenian team's success at the Chess Olympiads and in the PCL, I believe, that they are actually really good friends. They help each other on a regular basis, not just during the competition. No, absolutely. And, and they've said that it helps. And everyone around the world in Olympiads, they think it helps. So um, let's check out the game between Zhang Di and Haik. We were just talking about him. And, well, there's a pawn on G4. Oh, Gary. Yeah, Gary the G-pawn is going up to Gary 5. And that octopus, is it called an octopus knight or just an octopus? I think it's an octopus. Okay, so... so the knight is an octopus wait, on D6. Wait, wait. Uh, which... Okay. Or octopus knight. But I've heard both. Now I'm confused. I... I this position already is, like, cl in my eyes, almost close to resignable because mm -hmm. there's nothing black can do, and white's plan is very clear. But if you look at what happened here, you put the knight to e4. Oh, my arrows are still there. Get it, get it, go away. And still there. Mm -hmm. Those chess.com bugs. Yeah, so rook c1, knight b8, trying to get his bishop out. Knight b8, but if you, ha if you have to make a move like knight b8, that's and then already... It, and then it moved right back. <laughs> and this pawn just went through. And... It's just a clear, straightforward attack. Doesn't take too much out of you. You take, I go knight takes, and how are you stopping my queen from landing on h7? Now he has to play knight f8 to defend the h7 yeah. square, but that knight has been to d7, to b8, then back to d7 now on f8, and still black's position is undeveloped. Yeah, you know, you, <laughs> you can also just take this way and open the position more. So everything looks very, very nice for Heiken. Honestly, if this is not out of the question either. Bringing the rook up to the third rank and swinging to the king side looks like a very one-sided game right now. Mm -hmm. And I guess we haven't taken a look at the other games in the match, but we'll come back to this one. I think this game will not be lasting too much longer, unfortunately, for Zhang Di. This is not his best game, and we did see him you know, have that really heartbreaking defeat in the first round, so maybe he's not over it quite yet. But he is an amazingly strong chess player and just seems like a great person as well, the 12-year-old the from Zhangdu. Yes, I think he has a very promising future. And I know I'm bold when I said that he will be on the Olympic team, but I still hold on to that. Yeah, that, that was pretty bold. <laughs> Thank I'm, you, Robert. I'm, I'm I take that it. as a compliment. Well, it, it is definitely a compliment. It's also a compliment to how many strong players there are in China. right? Hmm. Because making yes. a five-person team when there's so many talented players in a country, it's, it's very difficult. And so uh, that's just really, honestly, compliments to the likes of Li Chao who are helping uh, grow more and more strong chess players. And speaking of strong chess players, well, we speak of everyone playing here. We have Wang Yue with the white pieces against Anna Sargsyan. And we have a dynamic here, Anna. I'm, I'm talking to you, not to Anna Sargsyan. Anna, Anna about Anna. But we're also maybe, you know, we, yeah, we could talk sure, to her as well. Sure. Opposite color bishops. So, hmm. you know, for people who think, oh, opposite color bishops are confusing, or they know opposite color bishops in the end game are always a draw, so people think. What do you make in a position like this with the opposite color bishops? In the middle game, the opposite color bishops can be actually a very useful tool in the attack. Because if you can create with black in this position, for instance, attack on the dark squares, that means that the g2 bishop will have nothing to say about it. It can never defend those squares. I know it's obvious, but it's not emphasized enough that in the attack, it's basically a virtual piece up. Yeah, that's very true, because this bishop can't go to g1 to protect f2 ever. And, well, this rook is also coming down to d2, so Ooh. dark square problems for sure for Wang Yue. And also, look at Anna Sargsyan's glasses. You can see the reflection of the chess.com board. I out. like it. This would be a typical Leonard Otis photo, yeah. I feel like. Or David Yada, right? Like just Indeed. one of those cool photos. I, I, sorry, I just got, I wasn't looking at the uh, the screen there, and now I am. And I'm trying, trying to analyze the position. Through it's her a, glasses? It's a different kind of eye tracker right now. It is. Where is she looking? I like <laughs> her position. I like her position. So the rook coming into d2, where shall the queen go? 
Hmm. Can I go queen c1? Because if you go rook d2, do I have... Uh, I would say f4, because I'm cutting off your queen from the defense of the knight. But the problem is you go queen to d8. Oh, wait, actually, there's so many pieces hanging. You take I, this one, I take that one, you take this one, and now... Pac-Man. Now I'm sad and down a piece. Oh, don't be sad, Robert. I'm, I'm going to try to get over it. So actually, queen c1 might be a good move, but you can just trade queens and still be better as black. Because you can't take with a rook, because I have two's hanging. And mm -hmm. after knight takes... Can I go rook d2? I guess rook d2, you have uh, knight b3, which is quite annoying as well. A little fork. I can protect mm -hmm. it, but then it feels like white's gaining a little bit of time here. Very much needed time, I might add. So. I just think that white is just in time to get out of this. It looks like white might just be barely in time. Queen b3. Going for the b7 pawn. But I don't really like allowing the infiltration on d2. That really concerns me. If you have rook d2 now, what's the response? Bishop f3? Like attacking this knight, protecting this knight? Mm -hmm. That's quite possibly because of it. It's a multi-purpose move. You defend and attack at the same time. It looks like a good idea. Can I... Uh, Is there a sacrifice? I'm looking at yeah. that too. Bishop takes f2 and the g3 pawn. Can we make this work? If we don't, we can just take it back. That's the luxury of commentating on playing. I know, I love it. But I, the thing is, you're not actually really threatening anything either. If we get black another move, you know, if you take on e2, I can just take you back. So I probably can get away with maybe going queen takes b7 and going for a checkmate or rook to g, no, rook g2. And after knight... Wait, actually, this is getting me in some trouble, isn't it? Oh, there's a queen here. Oh, I forgot there was almost. a queen here. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, let me go for a mate. Cool. Oh, it doesn't even, it's not even mate because there's a queen here. It's too early. I know. You still haven't had your coffee. I quit. It's all you now. Okay. Uh, I quit too. Uh, John, <laughs> can we call John Urschel and Alexandra? I think they can replace us. Oh, well, I think the people would love to see me being replaced. You, you're, you're a staple. You're not going anywhere. I already resigned a round earlier. I said that I will give back my title and the game was not as I predicted. So I don't know what I'm doing here. Well... I don't know what Zhang Di is going to do with his king here. Ouch. But actually, the queen on e7 is coming to defend. This looks better than it did before. Is it looking better than it looked before? I mean, I'm just wishful thinking, <laughs> but, you know, you, no. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is here that your queen can't even help in the defense because your rook on e8 is hanging. But mm -hmm. to, to Black's credit, rook g8 is only one move away. Not anymore because there's going to be a mate here, and that's a nice sacrifice because if you take on, on c3, I take on f6 with my knight, and I'm threatening your rook. If you take on f6, I take with my bishop, you lose your queen. That's mm -hmm. a check, and you have no other moves but taking. And if you don't, let's say you move your rook to f8, then I have just queen h6 check, and your king is out of squares. So you have to go queen let's h7, move. and I mate you. So rook c3 actually is a very, very nice move, swinging the rook to h3 with a mate, you can't move your queen to g7, which would be the way to stop the mate, because after rook h3, king g8, it's like, whoa, what's the follow-up? Well, here's a pretty easy follow-up, mm -hmm. free rook. So that is the reason why white is able to make this work, is that the rook on e8 is hanging. It's a beautiful tactical motif, and that means curtains for Zhang Di. He takes the rook, but we will see the line that Robert has described. Knight takes f6, and there is no defense. Is Knight f8, queen g8, mate. Ah. Uh, yeah, even this fails. There is no defense. That's so sad. You went knight at, I went knight f8 to try to block on h7. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll give him my rook or something. But yeah, that's a very direct checkmate. Just all sorts of mates happening here. Yeah, it's not good. And Hike just looks, he's cool. He's calm. He's ready to get a second victory in a row. He had a really nice end game win over Zhao Jun in mm -hmm. the first round. And now he's going to beat Zhang Di here with the white pieces. And a 2 0 start for him. Yes, he has been a key player for the Armenia Eagles here in the semifinals, but also, of course, during the entire season of the Pro Chess League. Both him and Shunt. So Shunt's defeat against Wang Yue, that is that is a game that we'll be talking about in case the Armenia Eagles will not get this match. That game could have changed their score. It's 2-2. It could have been a different story had Sean Sargisian won the game where we thought that Black basically blundered C5 and he could have lost a piece. Yeah, it, it just haunts the players individually, <laughs> but you know when it stays and 
What, what happened? <laughs> no, I was just <laughs> the puns. No. Oh, no. puns. I'm. I like the puns. Yes. Oh, well, I mean, we all like puns, right? Yes. Except when they're done, overdone, and done too frequently, or said by oh, me. Oh, that's us. That's. Yeah. I think we do that all the time. All right. So here. I see this game is coming to a conclusion. Rook G1 next. This king is still going to get mated. And then I saw this end game, which... What, what, what do you make of this end game? Oh, it's <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to analyze this are, rook end game. Are you being sarcastic? Oh, no, I'm never sarcastic. Was that also sarcastic? <laughs> I, I don't know what's happening here. I love rook end games. I actually do love rook end games. I actually do love rook yeah. end games. But the thing is we've had these amazing mating ideas in the other positions so now looking at the rook end game after all the mating attack and sacrifices fireworks this looks a bit boring and I'm, i the one thing i am concerned about is sean's time because that's what had him lose the first game is he okay well of course it's the trap bishop that was no longer trapped all that stuff but now he's a minute 45 he just blundered in a rook end game against mm -hmm. wang yue yeah and we talked about short term memory a lot you know we got to get rid of that but like that's definitely in the back of his head. Like I just lost an endgame that should have been a quote-unquote easy draw. Well, he shan't think about that. Oh, did that just happen? I know, it's oh, a no. bad pun. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I learned I'm, it from Danny. I know, that's what makes it even more awful. <laughs> and, Shout out to Danny Ranch. I, I, I just don't know what... To, after that, Sean... I can't, I can't <laughs> believe that happened. I can't believe it. But, I mean, on a serious note though, right? Like, you'd have a minute left... You're concerned about your own endgame skills because you just lost an endgame that should have been an e quote-unquote easy draw. And this still looks very easy. And the reason why we say it's a draw with such certainty is a symmetrical pawn structure. Both sides have five pawns. The pawns are facing each other. And where do you get in? If this king could go to f6, for example, then we're like, whoa, white's probably winning. How do you get there? The rook is cutting it off. Even oh, if, even is if that you, a clap? I, I thought I heard a clap, but I don't know. Oh, that's why. There is a clap because Heike Martirosian won the game. This king is getting checkmated. So unfortunately for Zhang Di, he loses this one. But he should keep his head hanging high. He's played some excellent chess this weekend. And, well, we all lose games sometimes. Even the best fall down sometimes. I did get the reference this just, time. I just wanted it to was sure. beautiful. It was beautiful. Oh, thank you. You so could have been a singer. No, don't why lie to you? me. Yeah, why Publicly are you doing lying the chess world? That's, that is a great question. The singing part is irrelevant <laughs> to that, that question, though. Um, so rook c3 is played, and was, is rook d3 check going to happen? I mean, that just seems to help things fizzle out. Um, the good thing for white is the king can get to d4 in, in a more advanced place. But then what? Right? Like if mm -hmm. I put my king on d4, yeah. which I think he's going to do, I can keep giving a check. Even if I don't give this check, let's say I go rook f1, if you ever go e5, you just lost your access point to f6, right? No longer are you getting there. And if you don't play e5, how is your king going to get there? Because my king's on d6. And so again, you, this is a situation where your pieces want to share squares, and they can't. And they shan't. They shan't. And he also shan't lose on time, because he's down to 40 seconds. Sean Sergeyan. That, that honestly is what concerns me. At some point, like this king might run to the queen side, and then you have to calculate everything. I wouldn't do that now with the pawn at four hanging. But that those are the types of positions where, if you have plenty of time, you make an oh, and this king is cut off. But I don't think that is particularly meaningful because my rook can just sit on c1. Hmm. Although rook d6. Yeah, rook d6 is coming. So. But then rook c3, check yeah. picking up the pawn and defending the a6 pawn just in time. So how is Li Chao going to try to press this one? If you go here, I can just sit my rook on c4, and then once my rook is here, I'm attacking f4. Yeah, that's going to be... A pr okay, rook c6, even better. Just saying, your rook's never getting to d6, and why can't... <laughs> it's going to go back and forth. King e8, king e7, king e8, king e7. We'll see this one be a draw. So let's go to this other games. I know we haven't checked out Zavin's game against uh, Zhao Jun, and this is the current position, but before... This game has plenty of time, I think... We should go to the game between Anna Sargsyan and Wang Yue because it looks like an even position, even by material, but this is a Fianchetto knight. Which is an interesting concept that is not very useful. Now the pawn on g6 is hanging thanks to the arrows that Robert is drawing. You, so yeah, for the defense, the knight on, F, the knight on g7 is not helping at all. The king has to leave the h5 so that knight takes g6 is not possible. And you just want to do this. 
Yeah. If you get that bishop to that diagonal, it's a big problem. And we can still see the chessboard in her eyes. Oh, not anymore. Well, yeah, we can. There. And she, I mean, it's tough because if we just go back to the position after queen b3, how did it go so wrong? So e5 was played, which actually threatens to trap the knight on h5. And so the knight no longer has the f6 square. And that's why g6 happened and the pawn went to e6. So unfortunately, her king is the one who got, they got in trouble rather than white's. Black's king got under attack. And we see this happen here. Knight on g7, not a pretty piece. And bishop f3. So it looks like here or maybe try to get to the e6 square. What do you think? Uh, I liked her position earlier. We <laughs> thought that she had good chances, but now it's the other way around. And we are still talking about the opposite colored bishops, and here it's white who can take advantage of the light squares once this bishop gets in the game, as you said, with bishop yeah, g4 or one bishop d1, bishop b3. Onto the a2 g8 diagonal and attacking the king on g8, exposing it. Because where do you hide the king if you can't go to the h file and you cannot stay on g8? Yeah, it's kind of like the emperor's new clothes. There's just nothing there. <laughs> right? Just, I mean, this is... I don't see it. I guess you can play knight f5 to get some activity. And so, like, if you play queen f6, it's good that this bishop protects the rook because that means I can make a move like queen f7 or queen... Can I tr somehow trade the queens, like queen e7? Like, that's where mm -hmm. black's chances are. If the queens are traded, then you're not in so much trouble. So that is what she should try to do. Rook f8. The good news is you can actually sit your king on h8 or g7 in many lines because you have the dark square bishop. Yeah. So if your bishop gets to... You know, f6, your mm -hmm. king feels a lot safer, and your opponent can't take advantage of those dark squares. So bishop g4, thankfully you have the e6 square covered, so you can move your queen, say, to d2. In fact, queen d2 looks like a very good move. Yes, creating an immediate threat on the f2 square. Um, she went queen f7, yeah, which she, is more passive. Uh, bishop d8 alert, perhaps? Not Ooh, another queen trapping idea. And the queen still had one square on h6, but this is exciting. So queen f6, can you avoid trading queens? Did I just force the queens off? Which is good news. This is what she should Wait. do. Uh, it looked not great for black a couple moves ago, and now it all of a sudden looks you know, quite pleasant for her. Yeah. Tables are turning one more time in this game. Queen g5. But, oh, look at that. She's saying no queen trade. I'm going to get aggressive. Because now the knight f4 is under attack. The... Pawn f2, once that knight moves, now feels some pressure. I like the fight. She's turning spirit. the tables. Yeah, I mean, she she might be, she's probably just better here now. So where's this queen? Where, which of these squares should my queen venture out to? Queen b3. Okay, knight f5. So it's very interesting because I, I feel like there's this mix of active play from her and a mix of like caution. But this is active too. She's threatening to take on g3 and there's a pin on the f file. But I, I guess you can just take on f5, like, let's say... Oh, you mean that it will fizzle out anyway to an end game? Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah, I'm just uncertain where her mindset is right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, a draw by her is a great result with Black and someone who's 300-plus points higher rate than she yeah. is. Yeah, 2,700 GM. But given the position, I feel like you know, she should keep playing with the, the momentum here and use that to her benefit. But I don't know. I could uh, just be totally wrong and... I'm going to switch over to this game between Zavin and Zhao Jun really quickly because wow. there's a rook on the seventh rank and there are many vulnerable squares mm -hmm. on Black's king side and White's king is very safe here. It is really safe. There could be only like one check on the back rank and even then nothing happens because of king to h2. What is happening to the Black king? On the other hand, with this open seventh rank, all the pawns have been pushed. Can I do that? Yeah. I always say, you know, try to envision the next few moves. So I want to play rook b7, and then I want to play this, and I want to checkmate you. But I guess black is going to try something like queen d5, but even this endgame is just not good. You can't move. Yeah, it's a very active rook and a very active bishop versus two passive pieces of black, and the pawns are falling, so this would be a losing endgame. And we have another result, handshake between Li Chao Li Chao and Sean Sargsyan, they made a draw that we expected that. They just didn't make any more moves, it looks like. The rook end game we were looking at. Yeah, just realizing they can't make any progress. That's a very good hold by Sean Sargsyan. Like I said, very talented player. He's been a stalwart for them all season. And so yeah, he holds a GM, super GM, rated 230 points higher than he is. Yeah, board one of the pandas uh, held to a draw. 
shunt with the black pieces. So this is a good result for the Eagles, and they are still up a point in the overall score. Yeah, and so now it's between Anna Sargsyan, she's playing, and we also have Zavin Andreasen with the white pieces. So he went to rook d7. He said, I'm not going to allow you to go queen d5 and trade pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go try to checkmate you. And so kind of holding the position steady. But I, I kind of wonder if is black really in that poor of shape? Maybe rook e8 was the plan in the first place anyway to put, put the rook on e7 and try to take over the seventh rank, perhaps. Now, I don't like black's position. But And this A5 pawn actually is hanging in many lines as well. But perhaps it's not as bad as I initially thought. Yes, it doesn't look that bad now with the queen on E6. Taking control of the key squares around the black king and also making sure that you can't really activate the white queen. So the rook comes back to D3, but that means that he has abandoned. He gave up on the seventh rank. And A4, I like that move, fixing the queen side pawn structure. Yeah, and that way there's no pawn under attack. This pawn on b2, as you mentioned, is now fixed in its place, which means some end games. If the queen and rooks are off the board, this king would love to dart down to the b3 square mm -hmm. and put pressure on b2. Not to mention, in any dark square bishop ending, well, look what color these are on. Indeed, dark squares, which is bad news for any end game with the bishops on. So not just yeah, bishop end games, also heavy piece end games. In any end game, when you see a, a pawn structure like this on the queen side, so there's a B2 weakness, and you can't really get rid of it because once you push the B pawn, the, your A3 and C3 pawns are isolated. Right. If you have any kind of trade like this, you're left with these weaknesses. Yeah, this is really interesting because all of a sudden the long-term prospects certainly favor black. The king safety is really the issue, and queen f3 is a nice move coming up for the c6 pawn. But the king safety is what's making black worse here. But if some pieces are traded off, then it's all of a sudden black who's going to be better. And it's really difficult to see a path forward for white. I mean, these moves looked very natural. Last couple moves, you have this diagonal to work with. c5, because bishop e5 will be played. It's the only safe square. And is b4 the idea? But I don't love that, because now you're making your pawn weak. Indeed. You really want to just trade queens. Uh -huh. He plays rook d8, and now queen d5 is a threat, as Robert pointed out. After the queen trade, we mentioned that this endgame would be favorable for black. So his problem is the king, his exposed king. But queen d5, yeah, queen c6 you're yeah. pointing at that move. I like it, because that prevents queen d6, because queen d5, sorry, because of the g6 hanging pawn. And it's not just a pawn. It's a mate. There it is. No, I mean, this this idea looked very risky for uh, Zhao Jun because on one hand, he made sure that his pawn c6 wouldn't be hanging in lines. Mm -hmm. On the other, the light squares now are much more vulnerable, the b5 pawn, the a4 pawn, and it feels like black's position is just going to collapse at any moment. And why has so many options, too? You can swing this rook to g3. You can play h4, try to play h5 to open up the black king some more. And, uh, of course, the whole queen side is in danger of collapsing. So not great for Zhao Jun. He lost with the white pieces against Haik Marti Rosian. Mm -hmm. And now with the black pieces, Zavin Andrasen is just outplaying him. Yes, he's bore three of the pandas, but a 2600 Grandmaster, that's what we call a super Grandmaster, and he's not having his best tournament here in San Francisco. No, and he's, he's higher rated than the board one for Armenia. Yeah. That's, it's like... It's kind of crazy, and it goes to show that the rating system, you know, while it indicates your success over a long period of time, any of these players can beat the other. So, um, you know, also, it's a different format. So we have the classical ratings next to the players' names. That's how we we actually make the lineups, and that's the rating average. That's how we count the rating average for the teams. But this is rapid chess. The time control is 15 minutes plus two second increment, and online chess is different. Playing over the board, and it's an entire different story having to move with the mouse with these headsets on. Absolutely. And we have. Oh, finally some action in our live audience. I, I Shout out to our live audience hanging out, hanging out with us here at the Fawson Street Foundry. Thank you so much for joining us at the Pro Chess League Finals. Yeah, I heard that. I was like, did we miss something? Was something happening in the game? I think people are just excited. Yeah, I'm happy that they're excited. We are very excited about this match. It's for the bronze medal between the Chengdu Pandas and the Armenian Eagles. Both of these teams were hoping to fight for the gold, but instead they have the same match as last year, this time for the bronze medal. Yep, and Wang Yue, who was been part of this Chengdu team uh, for the last couple of years now, he is showing off his endgame prowess. I've complimented him earlier on how I've long admired his endgame skills, and well, he's up in H-pawn. Uh, her king is on the other side of the board. That pawn is just pushing. And a big issue as well is that 
Um, after king g6, I'm going to king g7, and when I promote, I'm taking with the king so I don't lose my pawn. And so, you know, I have this pawn on the board. You don't have a pass pawn. Typically, you see you sack the rook, you gain the pawn, and then try to make a draw that way. But here, it's unfortunately not going to happen for her. Anna Sergesian has played this game very well, but in the end, she goes down in this rook end game because of the elements that Robert has mentioned, that the b3 pawn will be protected. It's a handshake. I feel like Anna is playing very well, but she's not getting the results that she could have earned from the position she had. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. And sometimes, you know, one little mistake costs you a game. And unfortunately for her, um, she was, she's facing a very, very, very strong opponent. And, um, well, she wasn't quite up to the task. And that leaves us here with Zavin Andreasian with the white pieces against Zhao Jun. And this match is currently tied three and a half all. So if Zavin can get the full point here, he will also help his team go out to a lead. And the first round of this match is up 2-2. Right now, it's one half, one half in this particular round. And, well, he took one pawn, and the A4 pawn is hanging next. So it looks like Zavin is about to go up a pawn. But this F2 pawn is hanging, right? So if you take here, I kind of want to just go F4, F3, and get the counterplay. But I think the real issue is this. So I'm not going to take this pawn. I'm going after here. I'm just going to go here, and then I'm going to put my rook in d7. And that's game over, I feel like, because even if you move out of the seventh rank, the king is really exposed to d7. Can black survive that attack? Well, maybe, maybe for now it is okay. Yeah, because I'm a kind of queen e6. Queen e6. Six. Oh, I hung my bishop. No. And hanging with a check on top of that. <sighs> I'm so good at hanging material. I <laughs> wanted to go here. I wanted to be yeah. a nice little checkmate over here, and then I hung my bishop. So I'm going to take Thanks it to the hanging bishop, it's not that bad, actually. But I agree that it doesn't look very nice for Maybe black, queen, queen b8. B8. Let's go after this bishop. But... It feels like there's something. It does. But I don't know what. I don't know what that something is. So it's where we got to put our thinking caps on. <laughs> and... So rook d7 check. We're talking about this king is running to g8. That's that's clear. The king will have to come here. But how do we land both of our pieces on the seventh rank and then deliver a checkmate? Sounds just so and easy. And not to lose do, right? the bishop with a check. Yeah. In the meantime. If I could get that pawn back, or if I could put this pawn here, I'd be very happy. But I can't do that. So mm. how would to make this work? So let's say queen. Queen b7, king here. This bishop is always hanging. Oh, this is what's hang what happened. And what now? Seven and dressing down to 27 seconds. So the game is heating up. If you guys thought that there's no action, here we come. Time trouble. Both players are down on the clock. It's less than a minute for both players in a position where both of them can blunder the game away in one move one single mistake even just an imprecise move it doesn't have to be a big blunder but it can change the result yeah well, i don't know what the bishop's hanging with check and he's got to move it what okay can i take this takes takes check yes okay is that gonna happen so rook wow. g2 hanging with check then queen e2 check picks up the rook and then white is trying to make a draw there but i don't even know if you do make a draw because I mean just to show this really quickly as they I'm gonna go here and take this with check two. This is it's on the board. Rook takes G two has been played. Okay. Both players are below half a minute. There's a two second increment, but that's not much. Queen E one check and now he's gonna go and pick up Take that rook. Rook the rook because the bishop on F eight is alright so far. Yep. It will have to be check. Queen B one check. Check there, and then take that with check. Yes, and then he will capture on F8, so he has time. It's going to give a million checks. He can bring his, essentially, you can bring his queen wherever it wants. Cause if this mm -hmm. king goes to the third rank, you lose that pawn with check as well. So I can try to figure out where does my queen belong. And I would think queen c1, yep. I'm going to bring my queen to the D file, queen d2. I'm going to queen d3. Hmm. I think just gaining time right now, but trying to figure out where does this queen belong. I, unfortunately, I can't check you and protect this square. Like I would love to, if this king was on g2, give you a queen d5 to protect. But now we're in this situation where black is up a pawn, but I, now I don't... Well, I guess this king is coming this way. No, black's just better. Yes, it's a pawn up queen end game where there's no perpetual check thanks to that route that Robert has pointed at h4 in order to cut the g5 square away so that that could be a potential perpetual check. 
I'm just never going to say potential results ever because when I say it, it doesn't happen. I know. We are so bad at predicting results. Oh, queen e7 will be a check. So that's why it's queen d5. If you went to the seventh rank, you block. Now any check is on the diagonal with queen e7. So now king. Can the king not get out? He cannot go to f6 because of queen uh, d8. That would be a queen blunder. Yikes. Five seconds left. Okay, goes to e7. And now, so now king f6 is possible. Now the king. Okay, king is running here. Seven, six. King f7. King f7. There's no check. You've queen e7 check. You've got to make a move king too. Seven. Oh my gosh, it's going up. Queen c5 check. Don't go up here because then there's queen c4, right? There's a skewer. So queen b6 check. He's two, one. He's almost oh. flagging each time. It's his turn to make a move. I'm like not even looking at the clock. I'm trying to figure out a way, but you're right. Three seconds left. Ten seconds for white. Queen b5 play, but now I get the checks. Now I can go h5. Go h5. There it is. Now the king has shelter over here. h4. Just keep that pawn going. I like what Jajun is doing. Always giving these little checks to gain some time on the clock. And now here's h4. Who's queening first? This pawn is trying to get here, but this queening square is even closer. So king g5, no more checks. The pawn actually stops the queen from checking here. And now queen e4 check would trade the queens if necessary. The queen has to stay protecting the c5 pawn. And your own queen is blocking the c pawn, so you seconds, can't push. Four seconds, three. that's three. Okay, got it off. Now queen two f4, I like it. Oh, below the king can hide in h1. There's no mate. I cover it. Is my king in time? Queen g2 check. Oh, hey, queen g2. Just take it and bring the king back. Same idea. Yeah, and the king is catching the c-pawn. This is a winning king and pawn in game. Wow. And that's a win for the pandas. It's a one-point lead. One more time. Not one more time. I'm, no. I'm still thinking about the first game that Zhangli did not win. And there's now Danny it's Wrench. a one-point lead. Look at Danny. Give fist, fist bumping bump. <laughs> with a 12-year-old boy. Good job. Wow, that was a really <laughs> exhilarating round and a nice finish there for the pandas because Zhao Jun, we thought his position was very bad earlier mm -hmm. on. He came back. He won that game to give the pandas their... First lead of the match, I want to say. First lead in the match. It feels like they had the lead earlier because of the Zhang Di game yes. that we count as a victory. That's where we got confused, saying that it was 3-1. That was on me, not adding up the numbers. He lost that game in the end, the 12-year-old boy. But he played very well that game. And now it's actually finally a one-point lead officially for the Chengdu Pandas. Well, and I need to catch my breath after that ending. So on that note, we're going to take a brief break, but we'll be back after the break with round three of the Constellation match between the Chengdu Pandas and the Armenian Eagles. I'm here with Grandmaster Wang Yue and team manager and translator Alex Liu. Last year you played against the Armenian Eagles in the finals and you weren't able to win, but now you're up a full point. What, how are you feeling going into the last two rounds? Okay, I think this year and uh, the game is much tougher than last years and we are not at our best. Um, but today uh, we, we think uh, we are in our prime, so we have the chance to win this game. What makes you think that you're playing in your prime? Is anything different from last year? Uh, 嗯，就主要是第一天来的时候，还是队友们有点不太适应这个赛场，然后他们可能调整的不够快吧。但其实昨天发挥的也还不错，但是最终缺少点运气。As uh, reading is that uh, maybe and yesterday and we are still in the jet lag, we are not uh, having a better rest, and so that's the reason why we uh, didn't perform our best yesterday. But uh, it's it's also okay. And uh, today, and uh, we uh, get more rest, and uh, we are better than our than, than yesterday's performance, and that's all. Do you think that playing in the U.S. and having to travel and deal with jet lag puts you at a disadvantage compared to teams like St. Louis Archbishops? <laughs> Uh, it, it, it did wear affect uh, some of our performance uh, because uh, we come from far away from China and uh, we need to get over the jet lag, uh, but uh, it's not the main reason. And uh, uh, yes, yeah, that's not the main reason we lost uh, yesterday's game. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, we can perform better. Your fourth board, Zhang Di, is a 12 year old talent. Um, Wang Yue, you're coaching him, so is Li Chao. Do you think that next year maybe he'll be playing as your board two or maybe your board one? Mm -hmm. Zhang Di. 
，你觉得他明年有没有可能下我们的二胎或者一胎？他非常有天赋、呃，对，有可能，有可能，有可能，看看他未来一年的成长吧，我们很期待。OK， 呃、uh, ，it can be， and、uh, we also think John D is a very talented player. Maybe early the sky is his limit. Thank you. Back to you, Anna and Robert. But Robert is、oh. more than ready to、oh. catch I, I, up. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't realize that this was going to happen like this.、Um, this is kind of awkward, but uh, uh, I think it's a moment. It's Danny Ranch's favorite moment. We're gonna shoot somebody with I, a T-shirt gun. I, I just been told I'm a nice guy, and I thought it would make me look more bad boy. But I think that it's time to the beard the gun. Oh no, no no no! Let's not get there. But Anna, I'm gonna hand this over to you. Oh no! Oh、uh, no! Yeah, yeah, don't do this yeah, to me. You're gonna. Oh no! Yeah no! You don't want to shoot it. Uh, you should. I'm. I help you, but yesterday I I did shoot. Today it's you. Let's do oh, this together. Oh, I hear Danny say neither、together. of us are qualified. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Greg, Let's do it. Greg, show how to get the T-shirt. Oh, that was a great launch. Wow. No warning. None for you, Greg. I'm gonna put this down. All right. Well, I thought it was a great shot. Good I, job. I had a good time doing that. I don't want to do it ever again. <laughs> no, no, no more times. No more times. Next one, I can do it. All right. That's the least serious that I'll ever be, <laughs> because, you know, I'm a professional and all that. So anyway, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. As I, we, we definitely want to thank our on-site audience, but also our online audience. I've been chatting in the name of Danny Ranch. <coughs> I'm logged in on the computer under the name of Danny Ranch. So that was me in the chat, and thank you so much, Chesby, for the subscription to my own channel, so I can now spam my own emotes in the chat. Nice. Well, and we also <laughs> are here for some chess. I forgot that for a second because I should be launching a T-shirt. And right now, we saw the Chengdu Pandas jump out to a four and a half, three and a half lead. We heard the interview with Wang Yue, who was also here last year competing for the Pandas, and he said the games are very, very tough. And I think that much has been fairly obvious to us, right? They're very strong players, but it's just interesting to see how the games have so many dramatic shifts、mm -hmm. because there's the ups and downs, and the Pandas are on top right now. With one point, it's a one-point lead with two rounds to go. Let's have a look at the results from the previous round. Very little went wrong for the Armenian Eagles, the defending champions. Yeah, right there we saw that Zhao Jun won that final game against Zavin Andriasian. That was a game that Zavin really should have had, and unfortunately for him and for the Armenian Eagles, that went to the Pandas. So right now the Pandas scored two and a half out of four in that last round to get into the lead, and it's also thanks to Wang Yue beating Anna Sargsyan. Yes, that was a crucial game. Anna did very well. We liked her position, but somehow it slipped out after a complicated middle game. And Zhang Di, the 12-year-old boy, board four of the pandas, he did very well in the first round. We thought that he was on his way for a huge upset, beating a very strong grandmaster, Zevin Andrasian, 600 rating points above Zhang Di. But in the end, experience prevailed, and Zhang Di has also started with two. Defeats. Both board fours haven't managed to score yet. Yeah, and that has become pretty typical in the pro chess league because they're playing players so much、uh, higher rated than they are. And so Zhang Di at 1966, we know he's underrated, but even as underrated as he is, playing someone like Hike Marcherosian, who recently won the Aeroflot Open, one of the most talented teenagers on the planet, it just becomes tough sledding. And here we see the pairings for this round. We have Wang Yue taking on Zavin Andriasian. Now that is a heavyweight matchup. Li Chao playing Haik Martirosian, Zhang Di against Shan Sargsyan, and Zhao Jun against Anna Sargsyan. So, Anna, what's your favorite matchup for this round? I'm curious about the board for games as usual, whether they can get half a point. But apart from that, the Wang Yue Zevin Andrasian clash. That's that's the heavyweight lifting there. And how do you think last year's final tiebreak game will play a part in this one? Do you think there's revenge on Wang Yue's mind? Yes.、Yeah, so. Obviously, we are talking about last year's finals when the Chengdu Pandas faced the Armenian Eagles for the gold medal. It went down to the wire, blitz tie breaks. Wang Yue on board one for the Pandas, Zavin Andrasian on board one for the Eagles. They played three blitz games in total because it was a draw, and then another draw in the knockout system, and in the third one, Zavin Andrasian won, and that's how the Eagles won the title. So definitely flashbacks for Wang Yue. Not in the right way,、no, but I guess he's here to take a revenge. Absolutely, and now Wang Yue is on board two this year. So in the event of a tiebreak, he is the—he's、uh, not the last saving grace for the Pandas. That would be the player with the white piece right now, Li Chao. And we see Haik Martirosian playing quite quickly. You know, spent actually 
20 plus seconds so far at five moves. That's not a lot of time. And Lee Chow consistently gets ahead in the clock. And he's been, I think he really respects Haik Marti Roshan. Hard not to as a chess player. But he's spending his time. And I, I think he'll play something a little bit more mainstream in this game. And not what he did yesterday, for example, where he, well, he played some exchange slot. We got great positions. But I think he's going to play more topical theory to gain a, uh, a real opening advantage in this one. Yeah, I agree with you there. And that to respond to the question in the chat whether Sean Sergisin and Anna Sergisin are wife and husband, I would be a little concerned if they are married because we have a 16-year-old boy and an 18-year-old girl. <laughs> but they are not brothers and sisters either. They are not related. No, they're, they're not. I made that mistake. It's my fault. I spread that misinformation You're to the world. You're spreading their rumors. I just, uh, someone told me that and then... Uh, it was me and telling if someone myself, said, then it's the truth, right? You know, it's like the imaginary friend. Like, uh, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> someone yeah, told someone me. told me. <laughs> yeah, hashtag asking for a friend. Yeah. Hi, Tech Mar Hike Marty Rosen has been the hero for the Armenia Eagles in these semifinals and today in the match for the bronze medal as well. The current Armenian champion. He's only 18 years old, so clearly he's one of the prodigies of Armenia. Soon entering the Olympic team, I'm once again making a bold, pro bold prediction, but I think in this case it's not as bold. Did he? I think he might have played actually for the last oh, Olympiad. Oh yeah, you're yeah. right. Oh, yeah. I'm so bold that it happened already. Yeah, exactly. It I was happened. like, you're really going on a limb there to say that he will be a member of the Armenian uh, national you're right. team. You're right. In 2018, Batumi he already played because of winning the Armenian championship. Yeah, he's a very, very talented player. Here with the black piece, he chooses C6, and many players would have probably try to opt for c5 to get more activity in the position but playing c5 often leaves your d5 pawn as a potential target uh, after c5 i take now you have to make this choice do i take with the pawn and have what we call hanging pawns uh, they stand next to each other and if you push this one the d4 square is weak if you ever push this one well you can't really do that with my pawn here but more importantly you leave the c4 square weak and so uh, that kind of structure is tough to deal with and playing with a knight takes c5 you have an isolated pawn which isn't bad but some players really struggle with it. Yes. How do you feel about isolated pawns? Struggle. Struggle? Struggle. Struggle. Us junior shall about it too. We don't like isolated pawns. We are more of the classical player that would love to play against the isolated pawn, but it's up to you. It's a very personal question whether you like to go for the attack and accept the structural weakness or you're more of an I will wait for my better endgame strategy kind of player. Do you purchase a ticket? to the, sh the struggle bus, or are you the driver of the struggle bus? Aww. All right, neither? <laughs> neither? You just get on for free? Okay, well. I, I like free stuff. Give me I that mean, free ticket. I do as well. It costs free 99, it's for me. And now knight f6 to d7. So look at Hike being very patient here. He chooses to move this knight away from f6, where the bishop now are staring at each other now, because there's no knight on f6, mm -hmm. and just trying to trade some pieces. And note that if I take on d7, I would love to take with a knight. But if I take with a knight on d7, I lose my pawn on h7. So that knight is there for a reason. So I'd have to take with the queen, and then we're still offering some more trades. So I'm just getting some pieces off the board when you're cramped and you have less space. Trading pieces often helps because your other pieces will step on each other's toes. How shall I react to this knight f to d7 move? What do you think? Um, that's a good question. So if you don't take, what are you going to... You know, have to take something because the knight on e5 and the bishop uh, were both under attack. Mm -hmm. But took on e7 first. And playing with the f4 wouldn't work because f6 would have kicked the knight. And so it goes for the typical minority attack on the um, queen side, right? Pawn minority attack. You have two pawns on the a through c files. Black has three. And so you're challenging black's setup with your pawns. You might even go a4, a5, which is quite thematic. And I like what... Hike is doing. There are no more dark square bishops, so playing g6 doesn't actually really weaken your dark squares because it's hard to take advantage of it. So right now I think Hike is doing things correctly, but not as much space. We see a bishop on b7 that looks mm -hmm. more like a tall pawn. And you know, what do you think? I, I think white just I prefer white's position. White's position is very pleasant. Rook f2, b1, there will be a potential opening of the b file, and white is ready for that open b file in case of b takes a5 and the b6 pawn being vulnerable. So black captures on b4 to avoid it and has to go queen d8. That's sad when you need to make this retreating move with the queen, but he's ready to place the knight on d7, as Robert is pointing out. That's the way to protect the backward b6 pawn. Yeah, and I think people struggle with these decisions, and I, I want to highlight it for a second. What, do you take... This pawn on b4, do you leave it? But you realize that now this is a threat because you take back with the b, uh, the b pawn. 
And on one end, you don't have a pawn that's being targeted, but on the other, if let's say you go knight e6, pawn takes, pawn takes, you have some weak squares on the queen side, and white can very quickly double on the b-file, maybe even triple on the b-file, and black's position is lacking space and is quite difficult. So that's why the pawn was captured on b4, and then the knight will come to d7. So a4 is well defended for now, but at some point with a semi-open file and a rook on a, it could become a target. But um, for the near future, everything looks pretty solid. Yes, and if rook a b1 to put more pressure on the b6 pawn, knight d7 comes in, white, unfortunately for white, cannot put cannot use another piece to attack the b6 pawn. If you could use the knight, that would be great, but there's no such thing as stepping on your own pawn on a4. Yeah, that would be kind of cool, though, right? We keep I talking know. about share, sharing squares. Sharing is caring. Indeed. So, I mean, it's an Airbnb can, there on A4. Can, can I... How do I... I can't perfectly get it. Oh. It's almost there. Almost step on its head. I step like on I'm, the bone's I'm head. I am doing one of those math problems where you put a shape inside another shape and then talk about all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. So E4 played. That way you can break the structure, and if you take back with this bishop, there will be a stare down on the... A closed diagonal, but particularly this pawn on c6. So that's why e4 break was played here, getting ready to challenge black center and hopefully improve the white pieces. And actually, if you allow me, I might even consider playing e5 and f4 and gaining all the space in the position. It's definitely the right moment to break through. I think Danny Ranch is checking on me because I'm using his account on Twitch and I'm currently talking in the chat under his name. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind it, but he did earn a subscription to my own channel from Chess Bay. So once again, shout out to Chess Bay. Unfortunately, Chess Bay, I can't give you back the money for the subscription. <laughs> Thank you for supporting my channel. We all make mistakes. <laughs> we all make mistakes. Some, some of them are fixable. Others are not. Others are not. And I was going to make a, somehow a chess reference there about a mistake, but they've been playing pretty solidly in this game. And... I'm trying to think. So this isolated pawn situation. If I take, and you take back with the the, the knight, yeah, that makes sense. You want, I want to get there. But then I... Uh, it's, it's, these dark squares are, are feeling vulnerable. I said earlier that it's not such a big deal because there's no dark square bishop. And, of course, proving me wrong, saying that there's going to be some difficulties on some of these dark squares with a knight e4. And as I mentioned, bishop e4 also looks plenty good improving the location of your diagonal moving piece. Yeah, just an extra information about Hark Martyros, and I see in the chat that uh, he has already secured his place in the 2020 Olympic team of Armenia thanks to a qualification tournament he played. Thank you so much, DWJ Lang, for the information here in the chat. It's already moving away from my screen, so I was just trying to recall what you have told us. It's good to know that Martyros is already on the team for next year as well. So it's, you're saying that all the other teams should start preparing already just for Hike, because now we know. Yes, he's the only Information player. Information revealed. Levon Aronian may not make it to the team, but Hike Martirosian, he is definitely a fixed member of the Olympic team of Armenia. I mean, that's true, right? What if uh, Levon loses 200 rating points? Indeed, he, he will have to fight for that spot on the Olympic team. Unfortunately, I, I was making a joke, but Levon has lost a ton of rating points recently. But yeah, of course, we are being ironic, but Levon Aronian is such a world-class player, almost a world champion candidate. He was so close to earning his right to actually challenge the world champion. But in the end, the candidates tournament are not working out well for him, even if he's having a great year. Somehow the candidates tournament was always this one event for Levon Aronian where he would not succeed. Yeah, it is kind of funny, not like laughing at his expense, but it's interesting how that happens to Levon. He's such a great player. He's a funny person. And yeah, I mean, it's just somehow things just don't go right. I don't know if it's a nerve situation, mm -hmm. but yeah, that tournament's not really for him, which is sad because that's the qualifier to play for the World Championship. And that's the match many fans would have loved to see, Levon Aronian versus Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, in fact, I've, at times I think Magnus wants to see that match because Levon's mm -hmm. such an interesting player who is coming up with new ideas all the time and he's challenged Magnus. I remember that exchange sacrifice game where he beat Magnus. Mm -hmm. I think it was in Norway. So he's he's got another uh, a number of victories over the world champion. So let's see. Well, now speaking of the games. rest of the Armenian players, here we have Heik Martyrosen from the Olympic team of Armenians. Devin Andresian, he was there as the captain 
of the female team, I believe. Yeah, he was captain coach uh, of the team. So he coaches the yeah the, w the national women's team of Armenia, which is also a very strong team. And I thought you were going to say, which is also a challenging task. No, I because you are the captain of the U.S. women's I, team. I co I've coached yes the U.S. women's team, and it's a great honor and a privilege to do so. And it is it's challenging because working with many strong players is not easy. Yeah. And it's just you know on one hand they're so strong that all of these players that are playing in this in the pro chess league they have a lot of preparation but mm -hmm. also their opponents play many different things yes. so you're trying to narrow down all these options it's definitely never easy and here right now Wang Yue has moved instantly in fact he has 15 minutes because hmm. of the two second increment he's lost no time at all and Zavin is pausing for a think here and he's probably choosing between a move like d5 which challenges in the center, but also means that this bishop will have the length of the diagonal for a while. Or a move like b6, bishop b7 is an option. You can play d6 as well. There are several different moves that Zavin is clearly trying to choose from, but it's really about not this current position that he's thinking about. Mm -hmm. right? It's about the trajectory of the game. And I, don't know, I guess it's a good question to ask, and I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. now that I say it like that, is when you're in a position like this, do you differ, do you think, game to game on how you, you know, if you got this position tomorrow, do you think your position would, your mindset would change than what you'd play today? Definitely. Depending on who is the opponent, what is the tournament situation, the very same opening, the very same variation can have a completely different angle. So if you're saying, you know, if your opponent's a tactical player, you'll choose one move, but if your opponent likes more calm, tranquil positions, you'll choose the... Uh, maybe then you'll choose a more tactical approach, but if your opponent's like a super tactical beast mm -hmm. and a puzzle rush champion, then mm -hmm. you're going to choose the quiet, tame line. Yes, I think, depending on the players, of course, but uh, these professional chess players, they are playing against their opponents too, in a sense that they take into account what are the positions that their opponents like, where right. are they comfortable, and they all try to make it not happen on the board. So you, wanna, you definitely want to make sure that you are more comfortable with the position than your opponent. Take him out of his comfort zone. Absolutely. And it, we say not to play the opponent by rating because that is definitely not a good thing. You get distracted. You're like, oh, I'm higher rated than this person. I need to beat them. And you're not playing chess. But, it, of course, in prep, any preparation for any sport, you need to look into your opponent's strengths and, weak, strengths and weaknesses. Indeed. All right. So speaking of strengths and weaknesses, I looked at this game just at the corner of my eye, and I saw Anastigis in space, which oh. is like a tremendous asset. Um, weaknesses, I have none really to speak of for her. So I'm just speaking of strengths. She's doing very well. One more time. Her preparation has been impressive. She gets really good positions in the middle game. She just needs to finish in style because she has had good positions, good chances, but the results are not showing it. Right now, one more time, It's a, I think it's a very promising position for white. If we look at black's lack of space and the knights on h7 and a5, he is now creating counterplay. He wants to go for the king's side attack with f5. Right. Trying to take care of that spatial issue that you just referenced. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, you know, Ana says I don't have a space. Psh, I'm going to show her. <laughs> goes f5 immediately. And it's, of course, it's thematic. And she takes on f5. I was going to say that black has never really wanted to take on e4 because you can take back with your knight. And this bishop also is not a very good piece. But in taking on f5 like this and playing rook to b1, there's this question of what does black do with the pawns? If you go f4, then my knight still has the e4 square to use. Mm -hmm. If you play e4, then there's potentially the f4 square for my knight to jump to. I can go knight e2 immediately and knight f4. And, well, at some point I wouldn't be upset about trading these bishops off the board because that bishop's in front of the king and on a very long and open diagonal. So for the time being, on a... Well, actually, I was talking about her, but then I looked at Anna, you, and Anna. I was like, oh, it's, this is hard to do. <laughs> Rook b1 stepping out of the long diagonal, so there are no tricks or whatsoever. Queen f6, putting more pressure on the same diagonal, so in case of an e4 push, the knight on c3 would be hanging. Bishop b2 can always be played, of course, but it's a question. Do you want to place your bishop on b2, or do you want to keep it on the c1, h6 diagonal? I definitely want to keep it on the c1, h6 diagonal, move like bishop d2, spying on this knight on a5 comes to mind. And what I'm also thinking about is, at what point do I want to play b4? Mm -hmm. Because this knight, is on, it's not about trapping the knight, it's if I can in induce the move, or provoke the move b6, then when I go b4, there's actually a square to uh, 
a pawn to go attack. But I also have to be worried about my c4 pawn. It's one of those moments where you want to break through and open up the lines for your rook, but you also are giving your opponent things to open up to as well. So it's a bit of a risky choice uh, depending on the timing. It's a tricky position, and this is usually where a higher rated player will be happy because he's more experienced. Zhao Yun here being almost over 300 rating points above Anna Sergeyan. I still think that Anna will manage to get maybe half a point in this game a point. I know I've been predicting her to score in the previous games too, but I just don't think she can always get unlucky or that she will make a mistake in from all the good positions that she gets. I think you just like her name. Uh, maybe that's the case. Is it a good name? I'm rooting for Annas in the world. Aww. Shout out to uh, all the Annas in the world. All of them? Yeah, all of them. What, if, what if one of them is like a bad person? You're giving them a shout out too? Mm, every Anna is a good person. Oh, okay. Or a bad person. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe well, I'm such a bad person. I'm calling myself a good person. The, I call you Anna, but I know we have the Anna Anna talk all the time. Yeah. I like Anna. Yeah, but I, I like Anna. But it's non. In Hungarian, it's non. But I think people will not like our discussion <laughs> whether <laughs> my name should be pronounced one way or the other. So let's get back to another board between the Armenian Eagles and the Chengdu Pandas. Okay. So we, s we looked at... This, I was about to say, h4 is coming, and there it goes. And maybe this queen can come to g6 to put more pressure on the white king. The king's just feeling a bit barren for white. There's some weaknesses in the, the light squares, right? This f3 square in particular, I can see a knight g5, pawn e4, knight f3 jump at some point. Uh, of course, queen h6, knight g5, and coming after h3 also comes to mind. So very quickly, I'm starting to like Zha Jun's position much more. This f5 break was timely, and... Well, it's just breaking up everything in the mm -hmm. position. And that's what happens when you have an asymmetrical pawn structure, right? Um, there's no G pawn for black, which means it's easier to attack down that file. So we can come back to this one. I actually think Zha Jun's probably going to get the upper hand in this game. But I also wanted to take a look at the game between um, Haik Martirosian again and Li Chao. Well, it has changed a lot. Can we just have a look at the last few moves? We can, and shall. So this e4 break happened, mm -hmm. and c5. And Li Chao said, I'm going to take your pawn on b6, because now this f6 square is unprotected. or well, It's protected by one piece, but my rook protects. And then I would love to go queen h6, knight f6 check, and go for a mate. So rook to b8 was played. Now there's no forks on f6, mm -hmm. and the rook's trade is being offered. And what does white have right now? One pawn and a knight for the rook, and the c5 pawn also can be captured. In the case of, let's say, rook takes, rook takes, and I don't know, knight c5, that's two pawns and a knight for a rook. That's very, very good compensation. It is good compensation. I'm just looking whether there's anything concrete for black, because that would be my only worry if there's something right now. But the b1 square is covered by the bishop, the e1 square is covered by the queen. There are no checks for black, and that means good news for white in this position. Yeah, and I guess the concern, if you're Li Chao, is yes, you have these two pawns and a knight, but is it enough to win the game? Because it looks like these pawns, at, they're isolated, and so perhaps I can just go ahead and blockade them and you know, even try to win them, since they can't protect each other so easily. Yeah, can we just appreciate for a moment this jersey that the Chengdu pandas are sporting? I love how the panda is holding a rook bamboo. A big shout out to the chess.com graphics team, the designers behind this. I think Daryl is here with us, and uh, I just love the logos, all the team mascots. Yeah, that's I mean, it's just like he's perfectly seated, just show off the logo. Yeah, he knows he's on camera. It's, it's as if like this is some branding going on right here, and it's like the, is the panel looking into our? S okay, I'm, that, yeah, looking into our souls. I really, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's creeping me out a little bit, honestly. <laughs> but right now, Let's that move on. that pawn went from d4 to b6, and that's a. A nice set of two pass pawns on the queen side here, and a5 will help cement that pawn on b6, but uh, Marty Rosen's hoping that he can blockade and try to win the pawns, but I'm really liking Li Chao's position. Oh, no. We're going to zoom in on the panda. We're oh, going no. in. We're going in. It's okay. looking into your eyes right now. Wow. Okay, moving on to the Armenian Eagles. I mean, <laughs> Shout out to Spencer as well and the amazing crew we have here on site. There's no the way scenes. that's only scared me. Like I'm frightened right now. <laughs> But I think Hype Martirosian, as well as he's played in the first two games, he should certainly be worried about his position because I don't like when my opponent has passed pawns, and I also don't like when there are dark score weaknesses and queen d4, knight of six check. 
ideas are are potentially coming to really hurt my king side. So it's looking very promising for Li Chao. Yes, also taking into account the time factor, Marty Rossian down to three minutes versus eight minutes. That's for Li Chao. Quite a big gap for a rapid game that starts at 15 minutes. Absolutely. And bishop b7 is a good move, trying to get this knight off from its very good square. And that bishop will control the length of the diagonal. So perhaps black is actually just doing totally fine here, especially if you have to move this knight. See, knight c3, I think I have queen c5 coming after your b6 pawn, putting some pressure. Nope. Not that square, that square. <laughs> Down the C file, and I think the worst, well, there might not be a worst for Black. Maybe Hike just found a good idea. This could be, yes, because suddenly the pieces are not well coordinated for White. All right, and I see time trouble for Zhang Di, which unfortunately for him has been uh, a bit of a theme. He's gotten time trouble in, in many of his games, but here, three and a half minutes left in a very active position. So he is... Not down. I thought at first down a pawn because I saw two queenside pawns to one, but then I remembered there's a pawn d5. And, well, this is a tag team on the b4 pawn. Oh, shout out to Grandmaster Yasser Seravan, who is here with us one more time in the chat, and he's suggesting a move in the game that we were analyzing earlier, queen to d4. Yeah, queen d4 makes perfect sense. You protect the knight on e4. You also try to help this knight get to the f6 square. And so if there is a capture on e4, and you capture, well, if you capture with the queen, then you lose this a pawn, and then I put my rook behind, and then try to run my king over. Oh, and it's a pity. Yeah, I don't think. And there's no way to. But you can take with the bishop. Yeah, bishop takes. And that's right after my rook, and I move like rook to d8. You can move somewhere, but where is that somewhere? Queen. I actually don't know where to go. Because I I'm, I'm don't really want to allow a queen on the dark square to check. Mm -hmm. But I need to stay protecting my bishop here. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a, a little problematic. Yeah, it's, it's just my pieces are getting a bit awkward. So I can go queen e3, and I thought I got check here. Ah, I guess you just go g3, and the bishop covers the mating square, and everything mm -hmm. looks good. Because, well, you have two pawns that can start rolling mm -hmm. down the queen side. So yes, Yasser's move does look very promising there for... Uh, Li Chao and Queen E3. Similar idea, but maybe not as great execution. There's always this funny tactic. So it looks like you're pinning the knight, but you're running right into the tactical it's shot. A knight beautiful of six tactical check. motive. Queen takes S6 and you pick up the rook. Exactly. So the rook and the queen are protecting each other, but I just distract them, get mm -hmm. it out of the way, and win this rook on E8. So, oh, Hike only has 1 minute 57 seconds. Yeah, this is not. A serious time pressure. Not great for him right now and for the rest of the teammates we're, we're looking at Zhang Di's game. he's made this queen c4 move which I like Me offering too. change the, to change the queens and if you take well now I have this past c pawn Ooh. that's going to be defended on b5 or I can c3 see c2 it. is pushing baby let's just quote Yasser one more time you saw Yasser and all of a sudden now I'm he's inspired. influencing everything I'm inspired yeah one of the best things that Yasser ever you know really uh, taught me and was like we're in the same team together on the US team he was like talking about weak squares a lot of times people focus on uh, pieces like, oh this pawn on d5 is isolated it's a target but he is Yasser is just a wizard at figuring out what the weak squares not are now but what they will be hmm. 10 moves from now and how to exploit that and here are the c4 square in particular that's blacks for the taking and if you go bishop f1 yes you kick a piece out of c4 but then your f3 pawn is a, a bit vulnerable as well but this bishop is doing nothing here yeah. Absolutely nothing. So at some point, you're either going to go here on h3 to attack the rook. And, well, there it is. At some point now. At <laughs> some point right now. But the bishop on h3 also doesn't really do anything. Hmm. Right? It's it, it kicks my rook, so I can play with like rook to d8. And then maybe I'll go back to f1, because what is this diagonal doing? It doesn't seem that useful. No, it's not useful. It does chase the rook away, but it's a one-move threat. And as you mentioned, the bishop on h3 is still not doing much. Nope, but Zhang Di, the time trouble. That's really going to tell the tale, I think, of this one because you have two minutes left. The position still is complicated. I like Black's position. I really like Black's position. He can go Rook A8 instead of Rook to D8. I'm so used to having a pawn on the A file that you know, Rook A8 was the first thought that came to my mind, but going to A8 and hitting the A2 square 
feels like a, a pretty good decision. And there are some actual tactics that now that I'm thinking about it, I should point out. Rook d8 runs right to knight e6. Oh, that is so pretty. F takes e6, bishop takes e6, picks up the queen. Yep. That is a check, and bishops move both ways. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> well, it just happened. Oh, thank you for the yeah. lesson, Robert. I, uh, oh, yeah. I'm really appreciating the uh, time we've spent together, and I learn a lot about chess. The sarcasm game is strong with this one. <laughs> I do learn a lot. Yeah, you, you, you have learned that you know, you're just the nicest person ever, and now you're giving me some flack. But also, this, there's no way to stop the fork now. Hmm. Get those fork knights. Fork knights. Yeah, I knew. Fork I, was, I was waiting for you to say it. There's nowhere to go to stop it. The queen has how many safe squares? One, two, three squares, and all run into the fork. All of them are running into the same fork. Get those forks, fork emotes out if you have uh, the fork emote from chess.com. And also, there's a fork knight emote, literally, from I am Eric Rosen's channel. He's here with us on site at the Fossum Seat Foundry. Go, Eric. He is awesome. He is. And all the great pictures, if you guys have read the article about yesterday's matches on chess.com, most of the photos are by I, I am Eric Rosen. So apart from being a great chess streamer, he's also an excellent photographer. Ooh, and, that, and this excellent move from Sean Sargsyan, double attack, the rook on a4 and the pawn on d4. So what just happened was, okay, no, noticing that the fork is going to happen, sacrifice the queen for a rook and a knight. But unfortunately, after queen d1, you're losing material, rook a3. And this pawn is weak. This pawn is not so great either. But if black can get an attack on this king on g1, there are some open squares in front of that king, then it, it gives Zhangdi a chance. His time situation down seven minutes on the clock Oof. doesn't give much chance. Oh, speaking of time. I mean, the difference between 34 seconds and seven and a half minutes. And I see another striking. scenario here. Seven seconds for Hike March Five, four, three. Wait, wait, Make a move. Two, it. one. Oh, no. He did it. But now a7. Queen c1 check, king h2, queen. No, there's no. Th you can check here, but check. the problem is that's just one check. I block your check, and I'm going to get a queen here. Beautiful. It's a rook down currently for Y, but he's promoting the pawn, so the past pawns can be way more valuable than pieces. He's sacrificing the rook, but it does not matter because the other pawn will promote later. Go queen e4, and then get a queen. Beautiful. You don't even want to take the rook. Because the other way would be that you take on b8 and queen b6, queen c6, queen c8, or queen b6, queen a6, queen a8. Yeah, yeah. Just you, this is just very simple. One of these and go here. But I'm a bully and I'm going to go. You're a bully. We've always known that, Robert. Well, they say rook are f rooks are five points, pawns are one. But here I think these pawns are worth it. You know, yeah, they are like 15 uh, points. Yeah. Something. Oh, it happened. Yes, queen e4 is on the board. Great. <laughs> oh, that, that Mark Thurston is, is also a bully. Yeah, that wasn't a mouse slip. It wasn't a blunder. It was a desperate attempt in a lost position. And uh, unfortunately for Hike, he had two very good games to start the match. He ran into a very tough opponent, Lee Chow. And, well, credit to Lee Chow. Really nice exchange sacrifice. Great game. Getting the initiative and ended up winning. All right, we haven't been here for a while. That's a two-point lead already for the Pandas, so the Armenian Eagles really need to find a way to bounce back on the other boards. Well, this is what Anna Sargsyan is trying to do here because she went knight h4, queen move, and went take on a5, and knight takes f5, removing the guard of this knight on e4, and this king looks very unsafe. For example, this already scares me, but once I go to h1, what's your follow-up? My I next move is just either queen g2 or more likely rook e2, mm. My king gets to be safe on the light squares. You have a dark square bishop, and I have a queen on e4 protecting all my light squares. So knight takes f5. Looks like a good tactical shot for her, but knight c3 in response. Okay, what's her follow-up? I knight Some kind of queen c2, knight e7 check thing. Like queen c2 takes check. Oh, fancy. Here, check, and we just we do a little Shake dance. Shake hands. That, is that, that should happen. Oh, wait, why check there first? No, that, that can't be right. No, because now you can't get the queen onto the right diagonal. So, well, queen g4. Okay. So maybe... Oh, it's a... Okay, so takes, check. Here, I guess I go back because you can't go up without getting your king. Getting mated, mated so it will still be a draw. But maybe white can play for more. So maybe I was wrong. I was like, okay, I found a way to make a draw. I assume that, you know... Is honestly giving Zha Jun a lot of credit, being super strong grandmaster. Like he knows what he's doing. But honestly, it might be Anna Sargsyan, and you said this many times. She may not be scoring so well, but she's playing excellent chess. 
And that looks like a pretty big initiative for her. Yes, she may be thinking whether she can get more than a draw out of this position. Do we see more than a draw here? Um, now the thing is that it's only the knight and the queen that are attacking. You don't have a third piece to join the attack. Yeah, and the queen c2 check draws your queen away from your king, right? So it's a very risky move to play. But it might be a good move because if I give you a check and your king goes, I don't know where, one of these squares, let's go h1, and I take and you give me a check, can I just... Oh no! <laughs> but I, I was gonna. I'll show Bishop the mate. Basic, if not King G A Knight E seven, beautiful. Yeah, I cut away all your squares. But here, Bishop H six, and I, I don't. I don't know if you're getting this knight back. So it looks uh, very good for mm -hmm. Black. So maybe Rook F six played, trying to double rooks on the F file. But now I would play. So this attacks the knight, but it's funny. This knight can go on a journey. And go to a2. Just keep mm. attacking. And there's no it. rook c2 because of the queen hiding on h7. Do not blunder your rook. Rook b2, that's definitely the right move, covering the very important f2 square. So what can black do here to take advantage? Uh, some kind of simple move like rook b8, three, knight takes a4 should not work out because you go rook b8, I can go knight c6 and just attack your rook. And But, I mean, maybe drawing your knight over here and then flipping over to the f file makes some sense as well. I like rook f6, preventing the ideas of the perpetual. So both the g6 square is covered and there's no queen e6 coming either. So clearly, black is doing his best to create chances. Yep. Because as soon as this knight moves, then rook g8 comes. And all of a sudden, black's pieces are on perfect squares. So maybe my queen c2 move, I was being safe and trying to secure that draw. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll come back to hurt Anna that you know she went for the more active try. and It looked pretty natural in a way. But it seems like her king is the one that's less safe, despite the black king having no pawns in front of it. Yes, it's a pawn up for white, but here you actually wish that black had a pawn on g7 at least. <laughs> then there would be no trouble on the king's side against the white king. Yeah, pawn on f7, g7. Somewhere where it's protecting the white king. Yep. Oh, Jean D has 15 seconds left, so I had to hop Gotta over go here back real quick. 14 seconds. I'm like, is this some kind of weird forge? Is a rook g4 coming after this g pawn? You need to go g6 because you can't go knight f6 i just take that's yeah a pin there's pawn. a pin Wee. g6 i guess it it sort of <laughs> for yeah. now i, I it's love that you, you, on. you looked so skeptical we you're are like, not on camera people don't see that i'm pulling faces yeah, <laughs> to I mean, this it, move <laughs> you're like yikes <laughs> well, there's rook g4 g6 played and rook back so just making use of the fact that now all these dark scores are weak so if the king ever runs, there's some checks on h8. So the king goes to h7. But where will progress be made? If you ever move the rook away from the a pawn, I'm going to take it. Yeah, so and you, that protects the seventh rank on top of it. You would love this, right? Mm -hmm. Rook on b7 would just be over. But yeah. how do you get there? Oh, that was me making that move. Probably not <laughs> going to happen. I actually don't know how you make progress here. King to h2 is saying you should also do something. 11 seconds left for the 12-year-old panda. Put this bishop on e4 at some point. And so I think that's what's going to happen. Bishop e4 or rook f2. Is they'll choose. Well, rook f2, rook a7. So don't go rook f2. But play bishop e4. Yeah, Grandmaster Yasser Servan also suggests bishop takes d5, queen e7 ideas to get into the position. Nice. Yeah, that actually, right now, that might be the perfect time. Wait, wait, what? Why didn't... Th why didn't yeah, why did he not take oh, the pawn? Oh no, he didn't realize he could just take this pawn. Well, he had yeah, he had 13 seconds left, so he did not really well, realize it was the moment. There might have been something like this as well. All, okay, all maybe we did not realize that everything is hanging. Oop, I flipped the board. I'm doing all the wrong things. Ah. You're good, Robert. You're good. 10 seconds left for Zhang Di. Mm. Nine, eight, and he plays rook eight. So rook e8. takes f7. You can take yes. on f7 and get a queen. And it's game over. Yeah. Two queens on the board now. Is This is a handshake moment already. He fought very well, there but this was a tough game for the 12-year-old. There are some fortress oh, you opportunities. Fortress? There, you have to be very careful. Actually, is this? This is... There are definitely fortress possibilities here because the problem is if you ever go g4 and I take, I'm going to sit my rook on f5 often. Because you can't win the king and pawn in exactly. game. You can't give up the queen. Normally, you transition to this, but this pawn doesn't win. It's a rook pawn. So you... Wow. I forgot about why? this completely, that this could yeah, still be a potential fortress. Wait, wait, why do you go rookie seven? 
Why? Yes, the rook should have been preventing the pawn push because now this is winning. Yes, this is for sure winning. A queen against a rook is winning, especially the, it's already like the perfect setup. You don't even the, all the hard work is eliminated. It's done. Yes. Yeah, because your king is already pushing the enemy king to uh, the rank. Also, with 17 seconds left, you don't have time to. E yeah. Even if there was some miracle way to defend, you don't have the time to do it. Yes, the fortress could have only been made with the pawns on the board. This is uh, a winning it, position, uh, but you shouldn't step into a stalemate. Rook g6, this is a stalemate motif. King has nowhere to go, but it's not in check. So, queen c8 check. And, all right. The queen e8. You know who knows this position way too well? I know Danny's listening. Danny loves... Really? Queen against Rook. Don't ask oh, me why. Shout out to queen, Danny Ranch. Queen g6 check is... is uh, so yeah, this is the way to win. And Danny will be covering the finals together with Robert. So if you're wondering where is Danny Ranch, he'll be here from 2 p.m. Pacific time together with Grandmaster Robert Hess covering the St. Louis Archbishops match versus the Baden Baden Snowballs for the title of the Pro Chess League, the 2019 Pro Chess League. We will be. That is correct. Uh, I'm still just mesmerized by this game here because I'm wondering if Sean Sargsyan knows the winning path or if he's just going to rely on his point of nine seconds left. He and knows it, I think. And yeah. I mean, not Jean I think. I'm sure he knows it, but he can play around too because it's seven seconds left for Zhang Di. What's happening on the rest of the boards? Because this is a win for Armenia, so they will get closer. It's going to be a one-point difference between the two teams. Oh, look at Anna Sargsyan go here. She has a knight and how many pawns? Two pawns for a rook. And the 95 looks weirdly placed. It's it's not stuck here because you can go this back to c6. But also it has the threat of going to b7 at the right moment. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, get your rook away from the f7 square, then knight b7. And it, it very importantly protects b3. So what black really wants is someone to put this king on b6 and then get a rook in the third rank to win the mm -hmm. b3 pawn. But if your king ever goes this way, well, I have pawns going there. Sean Sargsyan won the game. That makes the score four and a half, five and a half. Still one point lead for the Pandas. Yep, and we haven't even looked at Zabin against Wang Yue in forever, and we're seeing a another rook endgame for Wang Yue. He won the game against Sean Sargsyan in the first round. That was uh, more fortunate than anything in time trouble. He was able to win, but this endgame here, even material, both sides of the rook and six pawns. The black king is more active right now, but the black pawn structure is worse because you have three pawn islands and while black, white only has two. So I would say the game between Anna Sargsyan is less time and it's, uh, well, it's a bit more interesting on the position because of the imbalance here. So this is an exchange up for black, but it's a minor piece and a pawn that white has. The knight is a little far away from the action on a5. If it could get back in time, that would be great. Knight b7 to attack the d6 pawn, but we shall see whether there's any danger against the white king for now. I don't really see how black can create an immediate threat with yep. the two rooks and the king. Yeah, there's some kind of rook g1 check ideas. So, for example, let's say go knight c6, rook g1 check. And I go, oh, I want to go king, king h4. Well, king g6. But, oh, actually, king, it works because I have 97 check. And I can just oh, the knight is back in time. But I guess not. Uh, yeah, here. And I guess it's not quite back in time because that's mate. Mm hmm. And that's a weird mate, but one that... A pretty one. It's yeah. Weird and pretty. So Rook played h4. I like that. You can start pushing the pawns. Threatening fork g5. E, that would not be good. And actually, this Rook can't move off the sixth rank. So even if you go king h3, and then this Rook tries to come here to win your pawn, well, this pawn's falling as well. And after that pawn falls, so does t c uh, e5, c5. Right? That's the, that's the cr key pawn. I can't mm -hmm. speak right now. It's the critical pawn protecting both e5 and c5. And after king h3, you can also slide this rook to g3 if you want mm -hmm. to keep the pawn protected and offer a trade. That move. Interesting. Okay, rook f Oh, three seconds. I didn't even notice the clock. One. One second. He's got about the flag. Oh, we made it with 0.5 seconds left. Wow. Zhao Jun is really testing my nerves here because... Our nerves. Everyone's nerves. Yeah. The spectators are gasping. What was that? Yeah. And then now again, two points. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, really making it with no time on the clock. And now rook takes e5 is another pawn that Anna Sarkson can scoop up. But she might be thinking about her king safety. That's also important. She went knight e4, which is a more defensive move, bring your knight back to help the king. And now the king go to d3, and then c5 is falling 
Is Ana Sarkis going to win this one? Yeah, look at this beautiful knight on e4. Give me that pawn. A6 can Give be to me that pawn. Now uh, that Yasser is here with us, <laughs> we should speak correctly. What about d6? Isn't that just going to be a queen on d8? Ana's a, winning. I think so. One second left. And, it's oh, point 0.4 left. Oh, jeez. One. And, oh, point 0.6. I think just wants a different decimal point every time. And now there it is. Knight b7 going d8 equals queen. And finally, wow. Anna Sargsyan will get a victory after all those great games she's played. She deserves it. She has been playing so well, but she was not getting the result. And now this is a win for Anna Sergisian and the Armenia Eagles. Congratulations to the board for, of the Eagles tying the score against the Chengdu Pandas. Yeah, and she's played well all weekend. Some of the results haven't gone her way, but that is a great victory for her. And her team is there supporting her. We have one game left between... And the Blue Ghosts are back for both players. Oh, so we don't even need to talk anymore. Let's just watch that. That no, is, just was the Ghost. This is awesome. And, and that's not Zhao Yun on the left side, but Wang Yue. Yeah, it's Wang Yue playing as Zavin Andreasian. And also, I'm looking at them. Well, their boards are flipped because it's their vision, right? And they're looking at different parts of the board, which is very interesting to me. Yes. So you see both <laughs> players. Um, those of you just joining us, the blue dot is the eye tracker. So what you see on the left side is the Chinese player's board and where he's looking on the right side, that's Zavin Andresian and what he's analyzing. This is a new feature that we are using at the Pro Chess League. I'm loving it. I like yeah. it. And it really fascinates me, especially from this perspective, because we're seeing both players in real time thinking about the board and they're looking at different parts of the board. Uh, they obviously are overlapping in plans, but you know, at different moments they're thinking about different things. So what can we read about those blue dots and the handshake? This is a draw. We are late. We are yeah. late to talk about their thinking process. Yeah. I mean, w they were thinking that, hey, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. I can use a break right now. I'm Let's hungry just make too. a draw. I'm hungry too. But this has been round three, and the Armenian Eagles have come back from a two-point de deficit thanks to one crucial game that was Anna Sargisian's win and also Sean Sargisian. So the two Sargisians, yeah. not brother and sister, but they have the same surname. They have managed to get those crucial points for the Eagles. Yeah, we were talking a lot about Hike Marchirosian, who won his first two games, and we thought, you know, he looks like the X factor here. But all of a sudden, it's Anna Sargisian, who had a great game for the Armenian Eagles, and her victory was a really nice one. It was a battle where at first we looked, like we loved the space. Mm -hmm. Then Black was on the attack. She found a tactic and it made it, things complicated, and she ended up winning that game. And well, it's a highlight victory in her career. It was such a complex position and she found her way through, exchanged down, but she had a pawn as a compensation and then the knight came back from a5 just in time so her king was not in trouble. Very well played by Anna Sargisian. There's one more round left, so stay tuned. For now it's a tie and if it's going to be a tie after round four, we will see a blitz tiebreaker. I'm rooting for that because that's going to be even more exciting. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. We'll be back in a few minutes. I'm here with National Master Artak Manukian and Team Manager of the Armenian Eagles and WFM Anna Sargisian, who I just learned has eight WIM norms, but she refuses to accept it. So before we start any other questions, can you explain why you don't want the WIM title? Uh, I don't need this norm. <laughs> you don't need this norm because you're waiting for the GM title? Yes. Yes. Um, Going into the round, you guys had a two-point deficit. Now you're tied going into the last round. Are you really ready to beat Chengdu one more time? Uh, I don't. Well, we will try, but I, uh, we don't want to uh, horse, uh, I mean, put on horses. Let, let's wait until the round will end. At least we got a chance. Yesterday, you guys almost qualified to go to the finals, being the reigning champions. How are you able to recover that? Recover from that? Uh, so it was really tough because, in fact, we lost uh, to Fabiano Carona, to be clear, because uh, four out of four, I mean, it's a tremendous result. And in some games we had a chance, but we do not utilize it, especially Shant. And uh, it was tough, but let's see. At least we have a chance to compete for medals. In the last round, Anna, you had an incredible upset. You've shown to play very well against higher rated players. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what your psychology is like going into these games? 
Վերջի ռանդուն լավ ուժեղ կրեց իրել, իկո պսիխալուգյան մոտ Սավորուսնց վերջի խաղերին լավ ես կան։ Սկզբի խաղերում է լեր դիրքը սնորնալ ուղակի վրիպեցի ժամունակի պատճանը։ Anna, you're a professional chess player. You play for the female Olympic team of Armenia. Have you ever felt that it's more difficult to be a female playing chess? No. Okay, she answered no. <laughs> Do you think that the chess culture in Armenia has encouraged you to become a professional as opposed to the U.S. where there's a lot fewer chess professionals? Uh, in chess and Trevor is, is, uh, yes, uh, shortly. <laughs> that was a wonderful answer, thank you. <laughs> Back to you, Anna and Robert. It's really difficult to give an interview when you are still in the game, so I know Hannah Sergison is feeling, she's still thinking about the previous game, she's about to play her next game. I feel the pain. Yeah, you're just in that mindset when you're a chess player, you know, even though the game is already done, you're still thinking of variations. Yeah. It's going through your mind like, what if I'd move my knight there and this and that? And so we're all, we've all been there. So she's getting ready for her fourth and final game. It's a 6-6 six -six tie. We had the epic 2018 pro chess league finale between these two very same teams, and it was an 8-8 eight -eight tie. It went to the tiebreaker. So they're very familiar foes at this point. I wonder if we will see one more time of this tiebreaker. It would be epic if history repeats itself, not for the gold medal this time, but still, it would be great, a great show, a great finish between these very strong two teams. I wonder if we will get to see that. Four more games to go, and as we mentioned, in case of an 8-8 tie, we're going to see a blitz knockout finish, just like last year. Before we head on to the games which are about to begin, I wanted to ask our on-site audience, how are you feeling about the match? Are you guys having a good time? Are you sure you're having a good time? I can't hear you. Are you having a good time at all? Yeah? I mean, I'm not convinced. Are you having a good time? <laughs> okay, I think. <laughs> how much? How much did you pay them to have that response? Uh, I pay with Be chocolate. I have some dark, dark chocolate in my bag. That's because <laughs> I, I paid them to ignore you and clearly not listening to me. So. <laughs> Thank you guys, and we hope that you will enjoy the last four rounds and then the finals. The St. Louis Archbishops facing the bottom, bottom snowballs. Yeah, but before we get there, we do have the fourth and final round, as you see on your screens. That the last around was a two and a half, one and a half victory, mini victory for the Armenian Eagles, led by Anna Sargsyan, huge upset over Zha Jun. And of course, Jean Sargsyan beat the young Zhang Di, who's having a tough day. So we'll see in this fourth and final round, we'll see the board one against board one, two versus two, three versus three, four versus four. Mm -hmm. And why that's particularly interesting is we've praised Zhang Di all weekend as this young, very talented player who is capable of defeating pretty much anyone. But we, on the other end, we have Anna Sargsyan, who's much higher rated. Who and she's been the best performer on board four. So this is really the key game. We heard from Artak Manukin, the captain of the Eagles, that the board four's task is to hold the other board four or beat the other board four if you are higher rated, but not to lose that game. That's a key, not to lose to the other board four. And especially when it's tied 6-6, six, six, every single half point matters. And with Anna Sargsyan, the higher rated player between the two, she's playing very well. And this actually, I think, is the critical matchup because if Zhang Di can score a point, or, you know, more than zero in this one, even a half point, that's a huge benefit to the Pandas because they're such a top-heavy lineup. And the first game has just begun. This is between the two board ones, Davin and Dressian with the white pieces against Li Chao. Not the same match as last year. Last year, Wang Yue was board one for the Pandas. This time, they swapped between the two Chinese players, but of course, they are both extremely strong. Yeah, and we see in this game a closed Sicilian. So wherever Danny is in the... Uh, wherever he is here, I know he's very upset about it because I used to play the closed Sicilian, Sicilian and Danny would make endless fun of me saying, oh, this is not a real opening. And just you know, say, the reason people say it is because it's closed. Right? They, in the Sicilians, with open lines, crazy sacrifices and tactics. And here it's like, oh, let me play a slow, methodical approach. I'm going to... Oh, H4. As soon Harry as I said going that. going wide. 
Okay, well, it can be very active, Danny, wherever you are. But h4 here, of course, the intention is to play h5, open up the h file, and try to get your bishop to h6. Right? When your opponent feed kettos the bishop on the king's side, you often want to get your bishop to trade, and that way it leaves behind many weak, dark squares. And we saw that in Hike Martirosian's game um, against Li Chao. He took advantage of some of those weak, dark squares. I like this h4 move, very aggressive. Andresian goes for it. He usually likes this kind of attacking crazy position, so I'm happy to see that he's not afraid of his opponent. He's not like, oh, okay, it's 100 point di difference. Maybe I should take it a bit more solid. No, he's going for it. Yeah, he is, and he plays this against everybody. Like you said, it doesn't matter if it's Magnus Carlsen or me. He'll do the same exact thing and go venture into sort of non-mainline openings, but still have tons of bite in them. And here h5 has already been played, and that gives you the option of taking on g6, opening h5, or even playing h6 to kick the bishop on g7, where it's in a nice uh, spot in this long diagonal. And, well, Li Chao's going to have to figure it out if he can castle kingside, because sometimes you can castle into the impending attack, but often you don't really want to. And so he's going to uh, He's closing the center, making sure that he will have more space there, and the knight has to drop back to b1 so that it can land on d2 afterwards and go toward the king side, knight f3, knight g5 ideas, or towards c4. Yeah, this e5 move, next can come f5. As you said, close the center just to gain space, and then can, you can challenge the center with a move like f5 if you so choose. Uh, of course, you don't have to get so adventurous. You can play move like bishop to e6, or, well, here, bishop g4, provoking f3. And saying, if you make this move pawn to f3, perhaps some of your squares will be weakened. Yeah, can we just show for a moment that f3, bishop takes h5 is not recommendable because it would be once again a trap bishop. Theme of the day. Yeah, this one's actually trapped though. Finally, it's <laughs> trapped. Finally. And we have the ghost back on the board. The blue dots are showing where the two players are looking. So we have both... Li Chao on the left side, look at that beautiful green board. And on the right side, the yellowish, brownish colors, that's the Armenia Eagles board one. What are they thinking about? All right, well, we can see that Li Chao is thinking about things on the queen side over here. And now, oh, now the king, that's just fascinating. Their eyes are moving so quickly and their brains are moving extremely quickly. And I'm trying to figure this out because I'm also getting distracted by the, the other blue dot. I'm looking at one, and then the other one starts moving, so then my eyes turn to the, the right here. But, okay, so th what they are thinking about here is this knight on c4. You can capture it on c4 at some moment, but after d takes c4, then you just handed white the two bishops. So it's not really advisable to give white the bishops like this because I can swing my bishop to g4, and if you play f5, I can always swing my bishop back because I would want you to play f5 to help open up my bishop at some point. Um, if you don't take on c4... You can't make a move like bishop g4, which you certainly would think about uh, under normal circumstances because you, you're leaving the d6 square once I trade on g4. And then knight comes in with check, and your b7 pawn will fall as well. So f5 played, which is the um, aggressive approach, and it also allows some lines black to think about playing e4 as your pawn is needed to protect the knight on c4, and I gain space and attack your bishop on f3 and just looking like a marvelous position if you ch take this pawn on f5, which I do not think Zavin will do. I'm mesmerized by the blue dots and how quickly they are flickering around the central squares. Clearly, all those lines are being calculated. What shall happen to the e4 pawn? Whether shall, we, shall, shall he take on f5? If he does not take on f5, what are the alternatives for white? Yeah, when bishop g2 to allow white to play even pawn f4. But it's amazing that black is ahead in development. Like, white just kind of shuffled pieces around and went for h4, h5. And it's not gaining white much in the way uh, of an attack because black can just castle queenside at any moment. That's true. So the last moves have been bishop to g2 and bishop f6. And we have uh, the other game uh, up as well. We have Sean Sargassian playing against... Um, against Zha Jun here, and I just saw the username Chess Fat Bear, and I know Danny loves that username. I like it too. And actually, we got an explanation at the media day about this username. Uh, clearly, it was pointed out that Zhao Yun is uh, not a heavyweight player. Why is he called the Chess Fat Panda? His dog. His dog is Fat Panda, so he's using the nickname Fat of Bear, his yeah. dog. Yeah, dog I, is named I find Fat that adorable. <laughs> Your 
you as a player pick your username based on what your dog's name is. Oh, I think the the name was adorable. It's of the adorable, dog. but now that I know the story behind it, that that's how he calls his dog, and then he chose it as, as a name for the Pro Chess League. I think that's an adorable story. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. It is it is very nice. I I, I like that as well. And we see that's Heik Martirosian on the on the screen, but. Um, but we call him Sean to, for now. Just for now. <laughs> it's easy to confuse the players, so. Well, they're on the same team, happens. and we're just you know, going through the from from member to member. Um, but that is Heik Martirosian on screen, and uh, he's. Well, he's been two out of three so far. He lost that last round to Li Chao. And he is... Oh, he's underway as well. He's playing against Wang Yue this time with the white pieces. And ah, this opening here. The point is you're centered around the E4 square. If white is able to get E4, you're very happy. But black at any moment can capture on C3 and remove one of the defenders of the E4 push. And black can always plug a knight on E4 as well to try to trade some knights. Ana, do you have experience uh, with either color in, in this position? Very brief experience. I did study these lines, but I can't call myself anything but uh, a <laughs> beginner in these lines. So what about you, Robert? Well, I was just going to note, you're probably not used to having a bishop outside of a pawn chain. And Excuse this bishop me? Are you trolling me again? Uh, maybe. And Oh, important to note that right there, you could have taken on c3. And pawn takes c3, you could have taken this pawn on e4. But black often does not want to do something like that because the dark square situation. Again, this... Bishop will have unopposed diagonals to work with, and so um, this pawn wasn't gobbled up in this game. But something to keep in mind, because sometimes there are these gambits that people don't actually study. They know that it's acceptable, but they mm -hmm. don't really study it. Mm -hmm. And then it comes to backfire when they're at the board trying to figure it out. I'm like, uh, I don't see my compensation for the pawn. Yeah, so many moves have been played since. So the capture on d5, is the French pawn structure is on the board. But as you said, the bishop is out, so this is more like a Karakhan in that sense. Yep, and oftentimes, there it is. I'm missing that the bishop is on G. Like, why is it on G6? It would be so much better on C8. <laughs> yeah, you're just, you know, I I don't even know how you can enjoy it. We'll, we'll get into that conversation later. Sure. But the bishop on G6 is an excellent piece. It covers it the whole length of this diagonal. There, there's nothing, it's not attacking anything, but at least it covers the C2 square, so you want to put your rook there. Um, and it, the bishop on E2 is not exactly doing that much either. On the flip side, white has two bishops. So you could try to take over the dark squares. But this knight b8 move is very good. And actually, it's the move that sort of uh, a lot of the top players have used to equalize. Mm -hmm. Because the, by going knight b8 to go to c6, you now have a clear target on d4, not to mention a square on b4 to jump into. And perhaps the knight comes to c2 as well. So this knight went from a just sitting here without a real purpose to b8 trying to come to c6 and gain some activity. Yes, that's the explanation why you can waste some tempi on moving around with the knight, maneuvering it toward a more active square. And Hike just playing a solid game. And I, I wonder if that's part of the team, like if they had a meeting and they thought about this, is saying, well, Hike, you're a very, very good player. Uh, Wang Yue is also an excellent player. Play something with a slight advantage where you're not really at a risk of losing and just uh, kind of take it casually. I think they that's something that they must have discussed. Let's just remind everyone that this is the final round between these two teams. So any half a point one way or the other, any small mistake can change the entire match. They are playing for the bronze medal and they obviously want to be on the more cautious side, no one really taking a big risk and seeing how the other games develop. And then if your position is still, it's playable, but it's not too crazy, you can still change it. You can still go more all in if needed, depending on how the rest of the teammates are doing. Absolutely. And here, I, you know, his position is very solid. There are no weaknesses. So it's not like he needs to do anything drastic. And he, this rook a3 move is good. So the thing I was going to point out um, was that if white ever goes b4, so let's say I go h6 and you go b4, and you're trying to go b5 and open up some lines, my knight now can go to a7 because your bishop can't go on the square your pawn is. Mm -hmm. And by playing uh, b4, you also allow my rook to have a bit of a target on c3, and I've stopped your b5 move, and again, your bishop now isn't getting into the game, whereas if I do something like, uh, let's go to the game, I'm an f6, challenging the center, which is good, but if you go like knight a7 immediately, now I go bishop b4, and my bishop improves a lot in one of these squares. So f6 challenging the center, a very French-like idea. I like it. This is like the and I'm more familiar with the position. <laughs> it looks like a great French. I know. What's that bishop doing being so active? 
do you want to put it there and then put your pawn here? Back to d7. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course, it's a great bishop. I'm trolling myself. I don't even know why I do this. <laughs> it just, you know, you're so used to me doing it as you figure that you'd beat me to the punch. I'm missing being trolled. Oh, bishop c2. Taking away the b3 square from, from the rook. Nice. And also, trying to push this rook to c1 so when you go bishop e4, now there's a big threat with knight takes d4 with the rook hanging on c1. So trying to force his opponent into some tactics. And there we see Marty Rosian. He's a big soccer fan. I know that. And Is he? Yeah, and he honestly just looks like he could go out and play right now. In yeah, the, the he uniform. could go. He could go out right now, uh, sporting the colors of FC Barcelona. Obviously, I wonder how they feel about that. The players, if they are fans of the Barca team, we shall know more about that after the games. Yep, and they're definitely fans of Henrik Mkhitaryan as the. Famous Armenian footballer. He's very good, of course, and he does uh, a lot of great work for the people of Armenia. So he's a sort of a national hero, just Indeed. like Levan Aronian. I was going to praise the camera angle because we could see the player and also behind the player, the live audience. The finals between the Archbishops and the Snowballs will begin in just about an hour. So we already have a crowd gathering here because the world number two, Fabiano Caruana, will be playing later on for the gold medal. That's the big match of the day. But before that, we shall see whether the Pandas or the Eagles will get the bronze medal for their participation here in the PCF finals. Yeah, and I know that you definitely want a tiebreaker. I do want a tiebreaker. Tie breaker. It's a lot of fun. It, it definitely is. The format is great with the ladder and you know eliminating opponents. And you know went down for board one versus board one. We saw Georg Meyer win yesterday against uh, Li Chao. So the pandas actually have really bad memories of tiebreakers in the Pro Chess League. And we mentioned how much that counts in chess when you have a bad experience. So if you have a player that keeps beating you and it haunts you, it's not about the position. It's not only about the position on the board, but the psychology behind what happened previously between the players or, in this case, the two teams. Luckily for them, only two players are here from the exact same lineup. So Zavin Andresian was here and Wang Yue. The rest of the players, they are both, on, they are both new here in San Francisco in the finals, that is a new roster for both the Armenian Eagles and the Chengdu Pandas. Yeah, they um, they brought different players this year, but they are you know they came here ready to play. And Definitely. Unfortunately, they got uh, knocked out in the semis and in this match. But they it's chess players, right? When you have an opponent to play, you're taking them super seriously, and you want to beat them. And we see Zhao Jun here with the white pieces. You have the double B pawns, which. If I just told you, oh, you're going to have double B pawns that are blockaded, you're like, that doesn't sound very good. But you do have the open C file to work with. And this, not only is this pawn under attack, this C6 square might be a nice landing spot for my queen. If you play more like rook C8, knight C4 comes after the A5 pawn. It's becoming more and more uncomfortable for black. That's really problematic because of the vulnerable A5 pawn as well, as you mentioned, Robert. And also look at the time difference. It's a four-minute disadvantage. Shan Sargisian going down on the clock. It's still early to call this a time trouble, but you don't really want to use this much time in a rapid game that starts with 15 minutes. Definitely not. And C5 is one of those tough moves to play because on one hand, you would like your knight on C5 because if your knight was on C5, it would put pressure on B3 and um, blockade the C5 as well. But by playing pawn to C5, you already your backward C pawn, but now you have this D pawn that's a huge target. Knight C4 comes to attack this pawn and that's a nice outpost square, the C4 square. I see there's now a bit of a hype in the chat, not also, not only because of the games and these two teams, but one of our streamers, Snatch Pato, is in the chat. And we haven't seen him for months, so people are asking him if he's still alive. And it's good news that Mark is still with us. That, that Shout out to Mark. Uh, that is great news. Uh, you you concern me for a second. Ask if someone's still alive. That's really morbid. Now that's literally the question in the chat. I'm just reading. Well, uh, it's good to see everybody in the chat, all 4,000 plus, and <laughs> now I see people saying RIP. Well, uh, look, we got these last round going on, um, and let's see. What, where did he go to? I just saw Pawn go to D3 by Anna Sargsyan, and right now she has the two bishops. How did we get here? It was an exchange slav. So the young kid is taking the safe approach, at mm -hmm. least so he thought. So he thought? Yeah, because as soon as 
you know, Bishop Forrest, she went e5. So she said, I'm going to give you a pawn. And the reason why is because after you take my pawn, I have this d4 move opening up the diagonal for a very important check. So he went knight e4. And, okay, she won the pawn back very quickly. And it went d3. And after e3, there's a pass pawn here that is not that easy to corral. But this bishop on g2 is a beautiful piece aiming at b7. Black has no development. At least, not much to speak of. She's just collecting pawns. That's what I would do. I like free stuff. So I just go for the free pawns. Who cares that you're undeveloped? Your king is in the middle of the board. No, actually, <laughs> we, we do care. They can't see me, but I raise my hand. So who cares? <laughs> Robert like is a, protesting. I feel like a student. You know, I raise my hand. I, I care. Present. I, yeah, exactly. And this d3 pawn, if that's captured, then the material equality is once again reached. But this bishop on g2 is super good piece. If I'm black, maybe I don't mind losing this pawn. I go rook b8, try to go pawn b5. Of course, I'm going to castle first. But I do something like that and expand on the queen side. That's Zhang Di, the youngest participant in the Pro League Finals. Only 12 years old, and he's got two of the best coaches in the world. He's coached by board one and board two at Chengdu Pandas. That's Li Chao and Wang Yue, world-class players as trainers for this 12-year-old prodigy. I'm still going with my prediction that he's going to be on the Chinese Olympic team in a few years. I'm telling you, that is such a brave thing to say. Or, you know, you really are sticking to it. I'm, I'm just going all in. I, I hope he knows that you're like his biggest fan. I am his biggest fan. I mean, he's a great player. He's definitely someone to uh, follow. And so is this player, Anna Sargsyan here. She's playing on the black side of this, the dark score bishop is very much in her favor. She's probably thinking about queen c2 here and saying, what if I just try to trade the queens off? And she has two choices to do that. One is c2, one is e2. But either way, she's offering a queen exchange. If she goes to e2, she stops the queen from coming out to h5 or f3. If she goes to c2, well, I don't know. One of these squares looks like a, a good one for the queen. You can still just take and go after the pawn as well. That's definitely not out of the question. I look at those Changdu Panda fans I see in the first row dancing. That must be great when you have cheerleaders on your team. Oh, a yeah, few it. young gentlemen dancing. I I would assume they are here to support the pandas, but maybe they are fans of the Eagles. We shall ask them. Yeah, maybe they're fans of you or uh, you. who would be a fan of me? Come on, <laughs> Come, don't be don't be ridiculous. Many many people. Don't be ridiculous, Robert. And, and let's preview which players we will see competing in the final after this. And you know we're gonna see the Baden-Baden Snowballs playing against the St. Louis Archbishops, right? And that's the big match of the day. Not that this is not a big match, but that is the finals. It's The whole season has led us to this point, and we're going to see uh, world number two, Fabiano Caruana, lead the charge of the Archbishops, mm -hmm. taking on the Snowballs, which, speaking of team chemistry, you mentioned Armenia on that front. The Baden-Baden Snowballs are as close as any team I've ever seen. Yes, that's going to be a really exciting match. And we shall see whether Fabiano can go four out of four. It won't be that simple for him. Not that it was easy yesterday, but Gorg Meyer on board one. That's a bulletproof board. Danny Ranch makes an appearance in the studio. I was wondering if he wanted to say a few words. But we have Fabiano on screen, so we cannot p pay attention to Danny, unfortunately. But Danny, are you going to shoot some people again? Well, he, he's he, he's, he, he's, he he's here because of shooting. Yeah, you need to phrase that, phrase that differently. Um, I, are we going to shoot some T-shirts <laughs> out there? Sorry, there I'm in go. the States. I forgot I should be very <laughs> careful with what I say. <laughs> it just has a very different meaning, you know? It's just that in Europe it would never be even like a question that you're talking about something fun and non-violent. But for, for people who have been watching, like, wait, what, Danny's shooting people? What's yeah, going on here? Yeah, he's shooting T-shirts out of the air. It has been dangerous because the first one is probably still in the rafters somewhere. I know, it's somewhere up on the ceiling, so Danny should improve a little bit that aiming, but yeah, there's going to be a few more t-shirts thrown out here for our live audience, on-site audience, and we also appreciate you guys, the, our online audience, shout out to everyone in the chat. I am looking at the chat and I really appreciate everyone's support. Look at those emotes, A-game, A-game in the chat, you guys are the best. Absolutely, and A-game is what... Both teams were requiring from their players in this final round. Oh, what, what is this? I just turned back to Zavin's position, and um, this doesn't look very good, Anna. I, 
I don't know what else to say when Nine I see a... 9C3. But what, is, is White just avoiding developing? Is that against the rules to develop? I think Andre Sian was told that he should try not to develop to make it more fun. Mm, this is really an unappealing position because, well, there's this knight on c3. If you if you don't capture it, I can start taking on f3 and even consider capturing you on the e4 square, which actually seems very tempting because after g takes f3, if you take back with the knight, then you just lose a pawn here in the center, and then I'm going to move my bishop and start rolling my e-pawn. If you take with the bishop on f3, you protect e4, but your knight's still on g1, and you're not developed at all. So This is looking bad for the board one player of the Armenian Eagles. That's looking like a one-point advantage for the Pandas if this game goes as it should, according to the position. So let's have a look at the other boards and whether the Eagles will score on the rest of the boards to tie the score. For sure. And also, Zavin's down six minutes in the clock. So bad position, bad time management. It's a big issue for them. And two minutes. I didn't realize he only has two minutes left. Not good. And here, Wang Yue with the black pieces. We liked his bishop, and I like it even more now. Although, you, there's always a danger when you have a bishop on e4 like this, that because it's not actually attacking anything, if the rooks get traded, maybe I can just dance around it. Hmm. Because it's, it's not helping you. It's just sitting there. And so maybe you know my king would be able to just go over to b4 and to c5 in an endgame. Of course, with the rooks on the board, it's much more difficult. And with the rooks on the board, I can consider h5, h4, and breaking open the king side as well. So it looks to me like Wang Yue is, is sitting and just hanging in there, doing all right. But um, probably knight c8 to kick this rook out is coming. Probably slightly better for white. I see no risk at all for Haik Martirosian. But um, I don't see any way to make clear progress either. And he will have to try. In, in case Devin Andresian goes down on board one, the rest of the boards will have to make up for it and take a risk. And how do you actually create play in this position with white? Yeah, I'm, I was going to switch the game because I knew you were going to ask me that, and I didn't have a solution. So I was going to oh, uh, Okay, I, let's switch. I, I see play for white in this board. But Great. That's, <laughs> it's Zhao Jun Oh, here. that's white with the... Chengdu Panda's playing with the white pieces here, so that's, again, bad news for the Eagles. Yeah, that is a what we call a great piece on C4. That's a beautiful piece, and that's not a very good pawn because it's cemented on A5. The knight on C4 will forever target that pawn, and so what black ideally does is trade off these knights, but I don't see how you accomplish that. There's no clear way to do so. I mean, I move like 95 is tempting in this position. You have a pinned knight on uh, g6, h4, go h5 also. Very tempting. So I, I don't fully understand king h7 outside of protecting against rook takes e6. So for example, king g8, rook e6, there's some problems here except for the fact that there's mate on the back. So king h7 Yikes. wasn't actually a necessary move when he played it because there's back rank checkmate. So he walked in to a pin. He did. So now this h5 threat is definitely a problematic feature in this position. How, what can he do about it? He can't push the h-pawn, and you already mentioned what happens if he goes back with the king. Three minutes left for Shan Sergistan. The Armenians are struggling with their time management in this round, and also the positions are looking great for the pandas. Bad news for Artak Manukin and the rest of the Eagles fans. Extremely bad news. And, you know, Across the board, I'm going to pull up... Uh, on a Sargsyan's game, I think she is the best chance. Not only is she the high-rated player, she's coming off a very good victory over Zhao Jun, but here in this position with the two bishops, okay, maybe, maybe the bishops will get traded, but look how a bishop dominates a knight. Right, that knight wants to go to d4, but I can always capture it. And just the, the scope of a bishop is always very impressive. And this bishop can go to e6 if you so choose, and at whatever, whenever I can, I'm going to go b5 and try to push on the queen side. And once there's a pass pawn supported by the pair of bishops, that's going to be really difficult to stop with the white pieces. So the knight is looking great on d4, but it's not attacking anything. And the g2 bishop, yeah, that's the long diagonal, but once again, shooting in thin air. Yeah, and it's one of these positions as well where, let's say I make a move like rook to b1, and just to put this on the board, I go b5, takes, I can even take with the pawn or the bishop, but the point is, black has this outside pass pawn where white's is central and is blockaded already. Mm hmm so black gets a pawn that's much harder to stop. It's away from the king, which means in an end game, this king might have to come all the way over here where this king can come right to the center and get it. And that's really advantageous for the side with the outside pass pawn. And rook to b1 was played. 
going after b6. So I think Zhang Di is doing the right thing here. He, I would say, oh, can't go knight c6. You, you blunder and exchange an a1. But I was trying to get into an opposite colored bishop endgame. That was the goal. Yes, Grandmaster Yasser Servan also says that uh, knight d4 looks draw. Yeah, for sure. It uh, is definitely a strong decision. I think also considering the match situation, that getting an endgame like that is, you know, while it, it would be slightly better for black, it's good for the pandas because you're putting a lot of psychological pressure on the other teammates. And I, you already see that because of Zavin's game, and look where we are now. Oh, well, he managed to get rid of the pieces and not get mated, but where are the pawns from the board? It's two pawns up for black. Yeah. Although, you know, there's some... <laughs> some the potential, the, the king, king run. Yeah, take this one, take this one, they all fall down, right? And in fact, that's really not out of the question. Actually, he's just about to do that. So how do you stop this? He's bringing the king to the center. Oh, Oh, he just wants to lock in the white king, uh, coming to c7 with his king. But Is that efficient enough? Or c6, c7? Like, let's say we get here and I you know, a5, but then maybe b5. So maybe sort of like a pawn, playing essentially like a pawn ending, where you can put your bishop on e5 and the king can't get out. Ooh. Actually, that is really cool. Wow. And that is beautiful. Move. Yeah. <laughs> People say endgames are boring. Look at this endgame. The white king is logged in, cannot abandon the A file, and that means that even though white has a pass pawn on A5, he can never promote it. That's really awesome, actually. It is awesome. Chess he, is awesome. He went to keep the king to C6 instead of C7. I think that makes uh, sense. Now this bishop will come to E5. And is Zavin going to try to claim some sort of weird Zugzwang where after bishop E5, knight H5, it's like... Can black not improve the position? And if you move, then my knight, my knight can move again. Right? Hmm. My knight's trapped here. So is the king. So both the king and the knight of white are trapped. Almost. Almost trapped. They barely have squares. The knight has zero squares, and the king can move back and forth. But that's all. That's about yeah, it. B5 probably is what does the trick, because then my king can start coming after the pawns. So it looks like this should be... Yeah, here it is. This is what's happening. So the king B4, just here, here, here. Take, take, and, well, that's a queen. It's a queen in the making. Whoa. Decided. <laughs> that's a great idea. Interesting pawn break. Yeah, I decided that was really classy, actually. It was not necessary, but instead of taking right away and allowing the king to c6, um, Lee Chow says, I'm going to king c5 because your king has to go away from the square farther away, and then I take and go here, and, well, d3, d2, d1 equals queen is winning. So we should... Zavin also has seven seconds left, but this is clearly winning for Li Chao. It's going to be a handshake. I think we can wait for it because probably this will be a photo finish if we get the players on the camera. Isn't this over already? If Zavin move, is not resigning. Yeah, we're going to have a handshake on this board in a second. That's a very disappointing moment for Zavin Andresian. He's not, I think he simply does not resign so that his teammates don't just see yet that it's game over. I mean, they will get to realize that they are a point down, but he holds on to this game simply for the fact that it may help his team a little bit if the score is not added yet. Right. You can't get more than zero points if you resign. So, <laughs> you know, at the very least, just there it is. Now it's over. Li Chao wins, and that's a one-point lead for the Chengdu Pandas with three more games to go. Yep. This is for the bronze medal. And we have some interesting games remaining here. I mean, this one between um, Marty Rosian and Wang Yue here, I mean, it's a pawn race where mm -hmm. black is trying to break here on the king side, and white at some point would love to just push one of these pawns. Right? C6 will free the B pawn. So if these rooks got traded, I'm trying to sit, think of a – let's just put an example on the board. And we Actually, this might even be a decent attempt for white here, and then I can go C6 because once you take a go B7. Oh, that's pretty. B, B8 One second, a pawn break. So actually, take on f4 might be a good move if I'm taking over the g file. But of course, black is not going to take because that way, when it's c6, I have a rook defending mm -hmm. here. But where do I really go? I can't go to e8. There's a bishop here, and if I go to f8, can't my rook just now come to g7 and start, you know, like poking and prodding and trying to hmm. improve my position? Though this d pawn has to be stopped as well. So it's a double-edged ending. Like you said, people say endings. Oh, they're not that interesting. No, this is an exciting end game here with mutual chances. Now we've had some amazing endgame positions, so that's just great to see. And an applause one more time. That's a draw which leads to the pandas being 
even closer to clinching that bronze medal. Wow, yeah. It, Sean Sarsen's knight just went over to the ki uh, queen side, uh, going for the d4 square. And so then Jajun sacrificed this rook for the knight and pawn. And the point was, if this king sat on h8, once a move like knight e5 comes, there's all these checks. And so they just agreed on a repetition here. I, I wonder if white's just better here, honestly. This pawn is for the taking. Like, could have gone queen takes c5 instead of um, this repetition. But perhaps seeing the teammates, Jajun was like, you know what? I don't want to risk anything. I have given up a rook for a minor piece, so in the long term that could be a problem. So instead just made a repetition here. And the current team situation with this draw means that the Pandas only need one more point out of the last two games in order to win the match and get the bronze medal. Ooh, wait a second. I just popped in here on Zhang Di's board, and there's a bishop on h3, which means that there are mating threats. So the question that I initially have is, can I take this? on f7, and if king g8, don't take this because that's a mate. Ouch. Right? There, your king's mated. But I can move my rook back here. Yeah. But, but then it's like, can I do this? And after rook takes, threats here and here, but then f3, and I say, okay, the worst team is behind me. But then I'm gonna go rook d2, trying to give you a check and put your king in the corner. Huh. And then I'm say, f4. I'm okay now. Everything is under control. And that is a problematic. That is problematic. If Anna Sargisian cannot win, if this is a draw, that's already eight points for the Pandas, and they only need one more draw, a half a point, and it's match over. Yeah, and it looks like Rook takes up seven is a possibility here. And I think if Zhang Di takes that, then we'll see the Pandas going out to win this match. But if he doesn't, this is the type of ending where this A pawn might tell the tale. Because if it's even material in terms of peace count, but black is this light square bishop threatening checkmate. You have a dark square bishop, your opponent doesn't. So I, I do like um, honest chances, but if you lose the f7 pawn, it's a really important pawn. And you know then g6 is weak as well. And our remaining game, except for this one, so we have the board four match and the board two derby between Heik Martin Rossian and Wang Yue. How do you see this end game one more time? Let's have a look at the position. I still see there's chances for both sides here because this D pawn is the easier pawn to move, but because black can't afford to trade rooks, that makes it me believe that um, you know white is you know totally in this because you can try to at some point get this rook off the last rank, in which case C six breakthrough will work. A check from G five. Yep. King F six. Now the rook has to move one more time. So there's no time for a C6 breakthrough. But wh where's the rook going to go? So now King E5 back. Uh-oh. A draw is a bad result for the Eagles. I don't think that Martyrosian wants to repeat. Yeah, this is a tough uh, situation to be in because also this king might try to come this way as well. Yeah, what do you do in this situation? So you have board four where... The Eagles are higher rated. You may say that, hey, Anna Sergisian, she should win, but her position is not winning. Can you just let her play this when it's not uh, not a winning position? And she barely has a chance to win this. It's not just it's not winning. It's not even complex enough. No, it's not at all. And it, also, pawns are about to fall. So <laughs> White is the one who's about to be better in a second with all these pawns under attack. Yeah, this is a very difficult team situation for the Eagles. I think Marty Rosson has to play on. He has to try to win his game. But how? That's that's the question. He's going to try, right? We know that he's going to do it for his team. But where does White make the progress? So we know that it's all centered around the C6 break. That's where we're going to keep our focus. You can't take here. You know, this kind of pawn break doesn't work because, well, it's the double pawns. I can always sit my rook on B8. That actually just loses. But sometimes you can't sacrifice some material and go for it. Um, just not here. And what else is a possibility for white. Because if king d2, then rook f2 check is really annoying. Mm -hmm. And this king could actually see itself like almost mated, right? If I get a d3, king d4, king e3 stuff, your king is in danger of just getting checkmate. So d3 is on the board. And. So in case of king d4, we can give a check from the true. d5. The king is not coming in thanks to king d2. But Maybe. Oh, <laughs> wait. It is coming in. <laughs> king c4 and king takes b4. I I'm underestimated. You are greedy. Free stuffs. <laughs> free stuffs. I will gladly take that B4 pawn because oh, wow. I'll, then I'll go full Pac-Man on you. Yeah. I, that's uh, another uh, Pac-Man. Look at the, the Chang Dependence. They are about to 
clinch that win that they need. They need only one point for the bronze medal. That's team spirit holding on to each other. This is one last end game, two end games they have, but the board four match that looks way more peaceful right. than the board two games. I think we should focus on board two. This is the match. This match will be decided on board two, and if Hike Martirosian can make a miracle out of that position, or maybe maybe it's just Wang Yue winning thanks to his active pieces. It's definitely one of those positions where you try so hard to win that you lose, but you're doing it for you know good cause for your team. Yes. But wait a second, what if I can I do something like that? Check and here. And then take. Bishop C six. Uh huh. Oh, <gasps> and the B pawn would promote. Yeah, give me that, or I probably even C six. Like one of my pawns wow. would promote. But I do have to be careful because <laughs> I just realized if I do this, you go here and then I go here, so this pawn also promotes. So it it's got to be it's has to be timely here. But taking on E4, I mean, isn't this work? Take, take C6. And the reason why Robert is doing it is so that the bishop will be covering the D1 square. Oh. The audience is waking up. Yeah, that's even a... Wait a second, but now I take, take, I give you a check. Oh, but you lose this pawn too. Wow, oh C6 my is on the board, and this is the game that will decide the match. It may be a tie break if Heik Martirosia manages to win. They, they just woke me up right now. I mean, w what is going on here? I, I was trying to sacrifice them here. I love sacrificing pieces that aren't my own. So rook takes e4 was the way I want to go. But c6 is the more direct way, and especially because that's a queening with promote, uh, promoting queening with promotion. It is queening with check because uh, the king is on f4. Uh, so bishop takes c6, but now take if the bishop takes b takes, b7, then yeah, that would. D2, the rook will oh, catch the deep. Oh, uh, B8, this, <laughs> B8 is check. We don't need rook D7. Whoa. But this this end game is already problematic for Wang Yue here. And can I just go? Ah, that's annoying. I want to go here. Wang Yue shaking his head, and we see his teammates in the background from this camera angle. This is the crucial moment. Can the pandas hold on to a draw in this rook end game? Nope. You're saying no. It's, it's resignable right now after uh, rook b8 because I'm going to go with the check and push b7. Yeah, rook d6 check was played by Wang Yue. Oh, but it, yeah, he can't get anywhere. This king can just go back to b3 now. And even if I don't have that rook move, uh, pawn move and rook move, I can just go king a4, king a5. So actually, Hike Martirosian is winning for is the winning Eagles this. and will tie the score. That will lead to a blitz tiebreaker if Anna Sergisian and, and Zhang Di make a draw on board for. This is what we fans, all the spectators, have been hoping for. Unfortunately for the players, there's going to be a blitz tiebreaker if things go this way. Yeah, this is amazing. Look, <laughs> you can't move because if your king goes to uh, one of these squares, I get the check on one of these squares. And so otherwise, you have just to keep moving down the e-file. But my king goes up to a5 and, and it's six. over. Haik Martirosian wins for the Eagles, ties the score. We wow. Are left with one game, a I drawish position between Anna Sargissian and Zhang Di. Yeah, we were talking earlier about having the short-term memory. Haik Martirosian lost that third round game in a nice game by Li Chao. And he comes back and beats Wang Yue in the fourth and final game. So now everything comes down to Zhang Di with the white pieces against Anna Sargissian here with black. And, well, it's rook, bishop, and three aside. This king is way more active for white, so this king might just drop into d6 right now. And, well, it's not going to be a mating attack because my king can just sort of hide out here. <sighs> We're getting that tiebreaker. We need a deep breath. This game is still not over. Let's have a look at the time situation. Two 37 seconds left for Anna Sergisian. She will need to speed up a little. Zhang Di still has a minute and a half. The position is equal. But it's blitz, or mainly bullet, by this point, with two-second increment. Mouse slips can happen, blunders can happen. There's so much pressure on both players, so even though the position is calm and it should be a draw, Brook takes b5 is a threat that Robert is pointing out. It, this game is still not over. It's definitely not over, and there, you know, there's some tactical things you might have to work out for black, but especially, what if I start pushing my pawns? Mm. Yes, that, good question. That's a pawn that can start roaming up the board and just g4, f5, f6 check. Mm -hmm. That's kind of scary, actually. And on black's pawn, the other hand, in the a file, can't really move. Well, the bishop will be hanging, but even if you move, I can just sit my rook behind your pawn. So I would really consider g4 here as a way to get my pawn forward. Also, 
to be considered at some moment h4, h5. Similar idea, sacrificing a pawn to free this one. But g4, I guess g4 is bishop e2. I have to keep an eye on because h3, bishop f1, coming for your, your pawn chain. But an f5 just doesn't work out because I take here and now your pawn's pinned. So it's just in the right moment to stop f6. Zhang Di plays g4. He wants to create an f pass pawn, as Robert suggested. Oh, but he, he always has his king d6 move, actually. That's, that's going to be really 70 annoying. seconds left for Anasir Gisian. She should make sure to play faster. Rook, putting the rook potentially in harm's way here, but king e5, rook e7 check, king d6, rook d7 check. Then we're just back in the same position. So a <laughs> funny way to get to the same position. But right now, Zhang Di can play. He can try f5, but then takes, takes, bishop to d3, and then your pawn f5 is in some trouble here. Got your text, text, text emotes uh -oh. out, guys. Uh -oh. Text, text, text. Wait a 40 second. 40 seconds left. Wh what's wrong with this bishop d3 here? I don't see what's wrong, but 10 seconds left for Anna Sergisin, so she has to make a move oh, quick. Bishop, bishop d7. d7. It's even faster, but now the oh. bishop. <gasps> Rook oh, b7 no. picks up wait, the wait, bishop. Wait. Wrong corner. Wrong corner. <gasps> True. It's the wrong corner. So you need, it, you, you need to trade rooks. Oh, no. But how do you trade oh, rooks? Oh, no, Rook f7 check. No! She no. blundered her rook. She oh, blundered no. the game away. The pandas are winning. Zhang Di has a completely winning position. Anna Sergisin has stepped into that pin on the seventh rank and then dropped the rook as well. Drama. This is a huge drama. And the Pandas win the last game and win the match for the bronze medal. Yeah, that is a great way to go out for Zhang Di. The 12-year-old had an amazing position against Zavin Andriasian. He played some great chess all weekend. And it's nice to see him go out with the victory. And unfortunately wow. for Anna Sargsyan and the Armenia Eagles, that is a close and bitter defeat there. And she had a great day of chess herself. This is a bittersweet and the pandas, of course, celebrating their bronze medal for the Armenia Eagles. This is a heartbreak. The chat is going wild. What a game this has been. Time trouble. Time trouble, of course, was the main reason why Anna blundered the bishop and then the rook. Can we just go back to the critical moment? I Absolutely. If we have our board back, but I see that now we are focusing on the team, and that was a, the Panda celebrating their well earned third place in the Pro Chess League finals. Yeah, you know, this F5 move within time trouble is really hard to meet because the pawn trying to not only promote but also some checkmating nets as well. So after F5, the pawn was captured, G takes, Bishop D7 check. I was advocating for Bishop to D3 to win this pawn this way, because once the Bishop went to D7, to King D6, now two pieces are under attack. And Bishop takes F5, we transition mm. into an end game here with Rook against Bishop. It you know, looks like there's some very good chances to hold, but not easy to play on the fly. And instead, after uh, King D6, Rook takes F5, Rook b7, we're entering that rook and bishop versus rook situation. I think this is the move that she may have missed, rook b7, yeah. that the bishop will be picked up. And she can't trade rooks. That's the problem. As you mentioned, if it was simply a piece up, so the bishop and the h pawns, yes. even if it's a, a pawn, f uh, can we just show that, actually? I think it's easier if I don't try to blindfold okay. Can we cheat and yes. trade rooks? I, I, I'll cheat and trade rooks. I got this. <laughs> we okay. just want to be as instructive as possible. Do not mind the moves, but this is the position we were discussing. Even if you take away the black pawns from the board, this is still a draw because the corner, the color of the corner is the wrong color. With this bishop, light squared bishop, you cannot win even if you're going to win the H pawn. This is a theoretical draw. Now, this could not have happened because there were rooks on the board and Anna could not trade rooks. And unfortunately, Later, she blundered her rook on f2. Yeah, the, the problem is this bishop can't control both the g and a, uh, I mean, it can, but the, the can't kick the can of the corner. That's a real problem. So I can go here, and it's a stalemate. My king yeah. has no squares left, and I'm not in check. That's a stalemate to draw. So this is a well-known theoretical draw, which is why I always point it out, and I always tell my students, look to the corner when there's a bishop on the board. If it matches and it's a rook pawn, then you're winning in a situation like this. If it doesn't, you're... Uh, you're making a draw. Yeah. And here, yeah, there's a tough position because here after rook takes uh, d7, rook to h5 is a move, mm -hmm. but still, you're, you're in a lot of trouble because my rook can just come to f2 and I protect my pawn and I'm, I'm of a piece. Yeah. So even if I can try to work this uh, attempt at a draw in, it's not coming very easily. So in time trouble and blitz, mistakes happen, blunders occur, and well, well done by Zhang Di. 
Yeah, great game by the 12-year-old, youngest participant of the Pro Chess League Finals, and he wins the crucial game for the Chengdu Pandas. So yes, they have two Olympic gold winners on the team, Board 1 and Board of the Pandas, but it was Board 4 that decided the match in the end, their 12-year-old youngster. Yeah, what a match indeed it was. We thought it was about to be 88, and there were uh, ups, ups and downs for both sides. We saw in the first round of the match was 2-2 tie after that segment, but could have gone either way. It could have been 4-0 for one team or the other, and it was a really epic match. I think we're going to take a, a brief break here, and we are going to celebrate the Chong Dupanas, but we'll be back in a little bit. I'm here with board four of the Chengdu Pandas, Zhang Di, and their team manager and translator, Alex Liu. Zhang Di, it looked like that last game was drawn, but you managed to win and bring a win for your team in the final. Can you tell us your thoughts on that last game? Uh, because I think my, my rook is in a better position, so I insist on playing, and uh, finally, I win the game. Being the youngest person here, did you feel any pressure, or were you just excited to beat up on the older people? And uh, I feel both excited and nervous because I will play with um, a lot of players that uh, have much higher ratings than, uh, than me. Um, but uh, I, I cherish this opportunity to play in this event. Congratulations on getting third place. You were able to play alongside two of your coaches, Wang Yue and Li Chao. Can you tell us how you got started being coached by them? And I, I, I did uh, learn a lot from my coach, Wang Yue, uh, because uh, he's very good at uh, end games. And uh, maybe that's the reason why, why I, uh, when I struggle to the end and I win the game. I think we all would like Wang Yue as a coach, so you're very lucky to have him. The Chengdu Pandas are an extremely strong team. You guys made it to the finals this year, last year. You almost won the entire event. Going into the next year, do you think you'll play again? And what do you think the Chengdu Panda chances are of winning the entire event? Uh, 我肯定也会比较努力地学习吧。uh, we are I'm sure that uh, we will come back in the final for next year. And uh, the next year, uh, both the Chengdu Panda and I will become better. Thank you. Going back to you guys in the booth. That's, oh, and an applause, well-deserved applause for, for the 12-year-old youngster who decided the match in favor of the Chengdu Pandas. And we have board one and the team captain with us, Lee Chow. How do you see your student finishing that last game? That was the critical moment in the match. I think that boy is a like, lucky boy. <laughs> lucky boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that year also my student coming and uh, this year we changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this choice is uh, right. And uh, I was so happy and our team, of, of course, was so happy. But you know, like uh, Wang Yue, like Zhao Jun, maybe they are feeling not so good uh, like me, maybe Last yesterday we played not so good, so I was so happy today we can win. Yeah, and you know, for Zhang Di in particular, he played a great game as a coach. He must have been very proud of his first round game with Zavin on Yes, except for the blunder, of course. Mm -hmm. But how do you help him in between games to change his mindset to you know calm down, get ready for the other tough players he had to play? Actually, we don't told him so much because I think he's a boy and he can't control himself. So I think. To I just told him to do him best, do him best is yeah. the only way is. 
Yeah, and um, for you personally, you said you had a tough day yesterday, mm -hmm. and today was much better. Yeah. How did you feel about your play today? Uh, I think yesterday I was so nervous. Nervous? <laughs> was it the esports e environment? It was your first time competing in this kind of atmosphere? I think the point is first time to, to, to listen to music and uh, like a handful. I feel not so good and uh, you know sometimes I, I move my mouth not so not like in my in, in my country I don't know why but uh, did you use the mouse that yeah. was provided or you haven't brought your own yeah sometimes mouse. you know nervous maybe I if I want to put rook on c8 sometimes maybe I will put rook on c7 so sometimes I'm afraid of this so that's why I play a little bit slowly than before mm. yeah you were afraid of mouse slips and and that means you're also not used to listening to music. You're and mm. when you're playing at home online, you don't listen to music or you don't wear headphones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. What music were you listening to during the uh, event? Uh, I, I I downloaded some music and. Uh, Did you uh, choose white noise? Or classical music. You had to not pick classical something. music. I don't know how to say that. Like popular music. Oh, and yeah. A pop playlist. I yeah. like that. Some. Anything that I've heard of <laughs> or no? <laughs> Sorry. Have I heard of the music or no? The Chinese musician? No, no, no. Don't have that. don't have any words. I'm afraid of. Maybe we have some. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. instrumental yeah. music. Maybe yeah. the cinematographic playlist yeah. that we Got heard. It. Hans Zimmer. Got it. I thought maybe you know listening to some pop stars or something, but mm. get that no, no words, no any words. Yeah. So uh, you know, next up after this is going to be the matchup between St. Louis and mm -hmm. Baden Baden. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you in a tough spot here. Who do you predict to win that matchup? I think. I think do this. Yeah. Yeah. I feel Karana play very well, and uh, actually yesterday we have some time to some we, we have some chance to win. But uh, I'm afraid of if we can win, we also will lose to with Shen Luis because mm. Karana like both. Wow. <laughs> well. Very complimentary words of five. I mean, of, okay, he's number two in the world. He's of course very yeah, strong. Of course. And so, f how do you reflect on your weekend here? Sorry? How do you reflect on your weekend here? How did you, you know, of course, third place, uh, wanted to do a little bit better perhaps, but have you had a good time outside of the chess? Um, actually, yesterday our team very, very sad, and after, after the game, and we all sleep. <laughs> oh. Sleep until ar around like 11 o'clock and uh, something like this, but we are very, very sad, yeah. yeah. It makes sense because that was the match that decided whether you can play for the title. Mm -hmm. And it was so close. So yesterday's match, we are referring to the Chengdu Pandas versus the Baden Baden Snowballs. It was a tie break after the rapid part. 8-8 eight, eight, and then it went down to the wire. 8-8, eight, eight, then the blitz being tied until the very end and board but one deciding. But I think our chance not in tie break. Our chance like, mm. you, you know, one is game, he have very, very yeah, <coughs> good position, but finally he lost. And I think if we go into tiebreak, we will lost, because mm. I know Dunching and uh, Mayor yeah. uh, Chess. Com is rating very very high. Yeah. Uh, but you know, usually we don't play so much on Chess. Com because internet problem. And uh, you know, three minutes plus one. Th that point is we we should last one second to 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 put mouse. So we we not so good on this. So that's why. Three minutes plus one, I think maybe not so good for us. Maybe three minutes plus two is better. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why I think if we go into tiebreak, we will lose. Yeah. Have you played blitz tiebreaks before in any of the tournaments you've competed in? No. It was the first time you've ever had a blitz tiebreak. Even over the boards. Sometimes, sometimes we we will play some mm, blitz blitz chess in chess com, but yeah. uh, you know very, very relaxed. But <laughs> <laughs> when we are feeling very, very nervous. And uh, Zhao Jun told me sometimes his, his hand like this. He can't <laughs> control his hands, yes. <laughs> Having this in <coughs> mind, were you worried that the last game that was going on, Zhang Di, if, if mm -hmm. he makes a draw in that end game, it would have once again led to a blitz tiebreaker? Were you worried about that scenario? Uh, n actually, today better than yesterday, I think. And uh, we, we think if, we t if today we go into tiebreak, maybe better than mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. Because, you know, yesterday actually we have... In tiebreak, actually, we have some chance, but uh, in my mind, our real chance in no, in no rapid. yeah, in rapid, yes. Well, I have a question for you about what you do back in uh, Shangdu. So, can you tell people about your school and mm -hmm. the students that you work with and what you're trying to do uh, in chess? Actually, we, uh, me and Wang Yu, we make a chess club, and uh, we teach two levels kids. Uh, first, uh, we we have pro some 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 player like Zhang Di and. Uh, 
uh, some grandmaster Xu Yang Yu and the Lei Tingjie. Uh, of course, <coughs> after some training, they will go into <coughs> national team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other part, we training for some kids. I mean, they don't know how to play chess. And uh, in Chengdu, we have around like uh, uh, 10, <coughs> 1,000 mm -hmm. kids, something like this. Wow. Yeah. Uh, of course, <laughs> we of course we can't teach every right, right, uh, yeah, but we have around like uh, fifty coaches, yeah. Wow. And uh, Wang Yue is the manager, and he, he uh, we we train our coach, and our coach train the kids. Yeah, yeah, something like this. And so, with all of that coaching, does mm -hmm. that leave you much time to play chess of your own, or are you just mainly coaching these days? Uh, actually, this year I have a baby, so oh, congratulations! Yeah, congratulations. yeah thanks. <laughs> so that's why um, I think we. I don't have enough time to focus on chess. Uh, of course, I I will improve them, but not improve improve myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe after some maybe one year or two year, and uh, my kids grow up, and uh, maybe I will focus on chess again. Yeah. Will he or she be a future uh, she, chess she. champion? Sorry. Will you teach her chess? Yeah, Your of course. Baby girl? Yeah. I will teach her. Will you be her coach or you make Wang Yue? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. We, of course, first step by step yeah. and first let her teach, uh, teach from the other coach. Yeah. And then if, he have some, if she has some talent, and I will teach her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's nice. What do you think were some of the critical moments in this match? Uh, you probably did not have much time to look at the other boards. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your four games, which mm -hmm. were some of the critical moments in your games, if you can bring up some of those I positions? I think uh, game three, I played so well. and uh, Oh, we love that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were really enjoying the positional bind you had at first, uh, but then the sacrifice that you had was yeah. was pretty great. But you know, uh, game three and game four, I both sacrificed the pieces, and yeah. finally yeah. I win. I was so lo I was so happy. Yeah. Is it because after yesterday the queen takes c8 move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw it. Yeah. But but I miss b5, uh, bishop f8, and nice c5. Nice 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, this kind of idea. Yeah. But I mean, it put you in the mood to sacrifice pieces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, around here, we were talking about the position. Black's mm -hmm. a little bit cramped, but did you feel like you were, uh, you know, the driver's seed were pushing an advantage here, or did you think that Black was okay? But uh, actually, this game, in my mind, I, I want to play some slowly, mm -hmm. and uh, like position, position slow style, and yeah. uh, so that's why I changed knight and the b4. And uh, he played the g6, right? Yeah. Yep. I played a4. And until here, I don't know what happened, but I think a5 is a miss. In my mind, it's a mistake, but I don't know computer how to say. Because maybe he can play something like knight 6 and if a5, b5, and the close the position. I'm afraid of this by playing, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, but this piece is not very. Yeah, but you know. Uh, I play Slav sometimes, and uh, sometimes we'll be going to this kind of position, and it's kind of position should be okay for black icing. Of course, slightly better for white, but uh, maybe not enough win. So mm -hmm. I don't know after 96 how to play. <laughs> yeah, you, you just have more space, so it's easier for white to play, yeah, but yeah, maybe yeah. it's nothing so concrete. Mm -hmm. But So you think A5 was already a big mistake because it opened up the B5? Not a big, uh, a big, big problem, I don't know. But uh, after that, I uh, I have simple way to, to, to push, yeah. 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 And I was thinking here actually as well, maybe taking on b4 is a mistake because uh -huh. you can play a move like yeah, queen d8 first. Probably, right? probably, yes. Yeah, I was, mm -hmm. um, you know, essentially, what we're saying is that by playing pawn takes before, you give an extra tempo mm -hmm. because uh, you wouldn't want to take another rook on a5. Yes. So instead, you have this situation where mm -hmm. you gain the tempo. Mm -hmm. And did you already hear, did you see the sacrifice on b6 coming? No, 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 no. no. But after <coughs> when, I, when I push e4, I saw he can play queen e7, but yeah. I think I, I will play knight c5. Yeah. Yeah, but finally, I think if I play, no, 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 not here. I mean here, knight c5. Yeah. But I'm afraid of bc take and rook b7, I miss queen d6. And uh -huh. after that, I think maybe I will lost. You you lost? lost? Yeah. D4 pawn is lost. Uh -huh. I don't know. Oh, because knight c5 is yeah. a, a nice little fork yes. happening. Yes, so that's why I changed my mind. I play queen d2. I think queen d2 is a good good move. And after queen d2, I saw he, maybe he will play bishop a6 and mm -hmm. come back and c5. So that's why you see I play so fast yeah. because all in my mind. Yeah, no, and then the finish was beautiful. Yeah. Yasser Serwan was uh, in the chat and he was loving it. Yeah, yeah. but but you know, uh, here I think maybe I, have, I, I don't know if I don't play dc, I saw maybe I can play knight f6. Uh -huh. and 
yeah, I, I have taken king g7, mm -hmm. I, I find knight h5, but <laughs> finally I wow. thought he can play king h8, king h6, king f8, and I don't know how to improve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why I decided to play like. Wow. Safe. Yeah, can we just show that g takes h5 was not working? Yeah, g takes h5 doesn't work because that. Yeah. No, I, I mean earlier when knight oh. h5 yeah, check. It, it, same, but it never works. <laughs> it never works. Because we're going right the for the yes. h7 pawn. Mm -hmm. Wow, so yeah, this was a really beautiful game and we enjoyed the, the way Yeah, the but, but I think queen 3 is a key move. Yeah. Yeah, but I think queen 3 he should play something like rook c8 and uh, I don't know, I will win a tempo or not. Actually, maybe group C8, then build up D3. Yeah, it's one of these, I was thinking yeah, of yeah, yeah. these moves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I think he missed B7, this move. Yeah, B7 was very, very nice, yeah, yeah. because of the geometry of the board. If you take here, the bishop takes, and there's your rook, mm -hmm. because your bishop also covers the square. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no checks. But here, yeah. this was all beautiful, and it's funny, I predicted you would play queen E4 here. Every, every move is winning, but yeah, I said yeah. you'd play queen E4. <laughs> it's a it. beautiful finish. Yeah. yeah, you understand me. <laughs> <laughs> very well. So the first late. I'm meeting, but uh, Li Chao, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the Shangdu Pandas for coming here and playing so well, being such a great participant in the Pro Chess League, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to be back soon with the uh, the finals between yeah. St. Louis Archbishops and the Baden-Baden Snowballs. He'll be defending board one. Board two is Benjamin Bock, a student of the St. Louis University. Board three, a youngster from Greece. He is a creary on chess.com as you can see Nicolas Theodorou, one of the strongest international masters in the world and board four is Julian Prolaiko, the wild card who hasn't played a game before coming to San Francisco. Yeah, and he had a tough day yesterday. He lost all four games going getting checkmated by Anna Sargsyan in that final uh, matchup on the board fours. And of course for Baden-Baden we'll have Georg Meyer with the board one for the Snowballs. He had that exhilarating win against Li Chao yes, in the Blitz guest. tiebreaker, and he's been a you know very prominent part of the Pro Chess League. And look at that stare, that Grandmaster stare. Who would not <laughs> be afraid of Meyer? Uh, he's Alexander a very nice person. Donchen I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very nice person. Alexander Donchenko as well. The, all of the players here, I feel like all four teams have a really nice lineup in terms of how friendly and approachable they are. So you can go and get your selfies with the players, their signatures. Dimitri Kolar is defending board three for the snow. Was that's a very strong board three and Donchenko of course did extremely well in the Pro Chess League as well. In Agrest, the captain of the Snowballs and girlfriend of board one, Georg Meyer. Yeah, so it's going to be a great matchup between these two teams. I know I'm super excited for this action to take place. And well, on, um, um, what I am sad about though is, uh, should I say it? I'm be gone. I'll be downstairs having a beer with John Urschel. Okay, you'll be having a beer while I'll be <laughs> having to uh, analyze chess. Okay, I see. This This sounds like a very equal trade-off here. And I have to replace you with Danny. Ugh. You win. I hope that you will shoot more t-shirts in the air because we do have some more souvenirs. And I'll be downstairs to try to catch it. Well, with that, we're going to call this the consolation match. It's over. The Chengdu Pandas win third place over the Armenian Eagles. Grandmaster Robert has had the pleasure of having the call with International Master Anna Rudolph. Thank you so much. And thank you one more time to our on-site and online audience for being so great, always so supportive. I've been looking at the chat, all the comments, and our on-site audience, how excited are you about the match of the St. Louis Archbishops versus the Baden Baden Snowballs? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Okay, maybe now you're convincing me. <laughs> See you guys soon. I'll be downstairs in a minute.